And so we'll be discussing some sensitive topics today. And if you find yourself needing to step away, we do encourage you to do so. And for those who I haven't had the pleasure to meet yet, my name is Katherine Daria and I joined Sacramento Steps Forward earlier this year as the new uh, volunteer and training coordinator. Through this brand new role, SSF as the convener of the Sacramento Continuum of Care has been working to launch and expand our trainings to include HUD mandated offerings and also to better address the training needs of COC providers like yourselves and other professionals working in the homelessness arena. We're looking forward to make trainings available with regularity and to cover a wider variety of subjects that are informed by you, our other partners, and our community. And so I'd be happy to connect with you um, about, uh, about opportunities for volunteering training. So please feel free to contact me at this email um, if you'd like to chat about any of those items. In the next minute, we'll do a quick poll of the group to see how you feel about your current topical knowledge. And um, afterwards, we'll re-poll. Uh, after our discussion, we'll re-poll the group. And so I'm going to pull those up right now and um, get you going. For the next minute, I'll give you all a chance to read through these questions. This will help us gauge where you all are at and help our trainers, and then also um, see how we've improved at the end of our call. Excellent. We're our responses are rolling in. No folks are still coming in into the waiting room. We'll give you a few more seconds. to answer the poll that's up on the screen. Welcome to those who just joined us. All right, a few more seconds here and closing the poll. All right. And looking at our results here, it looks like everyone's human, yay. We love that. <laughs> um, and we have a variety of, uh, of knowledge coming into this meeting. And so we appreciate you all for joining us today and uh, look forward to exploring different topics uh, and intersectionality of these um, subjects. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing that poll and um, hand it over to, um, to Stacy for our next, for, to help set the stage for this training. And so Stacy, I'm happy to move the slides forward on your behalf, if you'd like. Sure, thanks Nika. Hi everybody. Um, we are so excited to be hosting this training. Um, it's been, requested by many of you, um, and it's been a while in the making, so we are excited that's finally happening. Um, we see a lot of different agencies joining us, so we just wanted to give a brief introduction of who we are. Um, Sacramento Steps Forward is a nonprofit that leads the continuum of care, <clears throat> excuse me, which is the regional planning body that coordinates housing and services for the homeless population. Um, so some of our main tasks that we do is we convene local, state, and federal agencies. We manage the grant funding for homeless resources. Uh, we administer the community-wide homelessness database. 
and we facilitate access to resources and services. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and so um, today's training is focused on domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking. Um, and as many of you know, domestic violence is one of the leading causes of homelessness for women and children, um, but it can affect anybody. Um, and so we see a lot of intersectionality um, in these two sectors. So as many of you are on this call, homeless service providers engage with um, folks who are experiencing domestic violence and human trafficking, while we have victim service providers who engage with people who are at risk of or currently experiencing homelessness. But our services have not always been well connected. Um, next slide, please. So just to highlight some of the efforts that are happening at both the national level and kind of more locally, um, there has been a, a larger focus now on survivors. Um, recently, the Department of Housing and Urban Development had set aside 50 million dedicated to house survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking who are either at risk of or currently experiencing homelessness. And in that last round of awards, Sacramento was um, awarded two rapid rehousing programs, which are operated by My Sister's House and Opening Doors. Um, and, and more currently, um, had prioritized survivors as an eligible group for emergency housing vouchers, which is a program that, that's now coming to an end. But we were able to dedicate um, 71 survivor, survivor vouchers. So they were referred to our program. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we've also been developing an entirely separate system for survivors to access housing resources, which we're, call <clears throat> we're calling the Survivor Coordinated Entry System. Um, and so what we've been doing over the last eight to nine months is we partnered with a group of local victim service providers, uh, many of which are going to be speaking today. Um, we adapted practices and tools from other communities that respond to the local needs of survivors. Um, we did things like we got documents translated into different languages um, to acknowledge the cultural sensitivity of the specific needs of survivors. Um, and we're continuously working on improving the processes um, to meet the local needs. Next slide. So looking ahead, um, we are planning on partnering with other agencies and victim service providers to expand these housing resources. Um, we also hope to train non-victim agencies to identify clients who have experiences of domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking to help connect them to appropriate resources. And also to create trauma-informed practices that acknowledge these experiences. Um, and we are really looking forward to today's training to help support you all with that. Um, and I will hand it back over to Nika. Thanks so much, Stacey. And those of you who don't know, um, Stacey is our coordinator coordinated entry specialist. And uh, I really appreciate you helping set the stage for today's conversation. Um, so we've these topics that we're gonna be covering are very real to Sacramento and uh, deeply interlinked with homelessness. So we've invited several uh, partners working in our community to help address these overlapping layers around human trafficking and domestic violence. For this first portion, um, we'll spend an hour with Roger Freeman, Terry Galvan, and Christy Kiefer. Roger Freeman is the Anti-Trafficking Outreach and Training Specialist for the Sacramento Office of the International Rescue Committee. He has over 25 years of experience in training audiences of various sizes on issues regarding human trafficking, domestic violence, and sexual assault. He's trained agencies in Northern California on how to successfully identify survivors of human trafficking, screening methods, and tra trauma-informed techniques for working with survivors. In addition to facilitating trainings to law enforcement, medical providers, and social service case workers, Roger also directly worked with survivors as a victim advocate for both WEAVE for 18 years, 
and for over three years as a care advocate for both UC Davis campuses. Terry Galvan has a, ma a Master of Public Policy degree from USC in more than 20 years of experience working with unhoused women, addiction, and commercial sexual exploitation. For the past eight years, Terry has served as the Executive Director of Community Against Sexual Harm, or CASH, where she leads a staff of trained peer specialists providing assistance to women who have been commercially sexually exploited using harm reduction and trauma-informed practices. Terry has provided training to local law enforcement, colleges, nonprofit organizations, and service clubs, and has worked closely with various law enforcement agencies to advance person-centered strategies. She is also a principal investigator for a research project estimating the scope of sex trafficking in Sacramento County. Christy Kiefer is the Victims of Crime Program Lead at CASH. Uh, she gradu graduated from Sacramento State University with a bachelor's degree in social work in 2015 after completing an internship at CASH. Her interest in helping women stems from her personal experience as a survivor and her passion to help others overcome trauma and addiction. Christy is a trained anti-human trafficking advocate, a member of Voices for Victims Coalition, and active in the medication-assisted treatment com community. And so thank you all for joining us today. In a moment, I will be handing it over to Roger. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. And Roger, you should have ooh, sharing capabilities. Thank you. My screen fully visible? Yes, you are. Great technology is on our side today. That's great. <laughs> well, thank you for that great introduction. And I really feel honored and privileged that I get to start us off talking about this topic at hand today. And again, it's, there's a lot of intersections, unfortunately, with the population that your various programs serve and also too with human trafficking and domestic violence, what we also call sometimes intimate partner violence. The topic that I'm gonna start the discussion with today really focuses on three different areas. One is I'd like to give everybody a clear understanding about the definition of what human trafficking is, how to identify potential survivors, either current or past survivors, and then lastly, start the discussion about how to assist. And when I say assist, I don't mean simply programs that are available to assist survivors of human trafficking, but programs that are available to assist you as professionals. I don't think it's any of our expectation today that by being at this training, even though it's three hours, that you will go away with all the knowledge and information that you would need to help someone that is identified as a survivor of human trafficking or domestic violence. So hopefully you will go away knowing that there's actually programs in place to help you as a professional when and if you do come across a survivor. Real briefly, you all know about my background. You may not be familiar with the agency that I've been working for for almost the last four years now. In my role, it's really been great to go out and talk about this topic, but also to, to spread the word about the agency that I work for. The IRC or the International Rescue Committee has actually been around for almost hundred years now. We originally were founded thanks to Albert Einstein that saw that there were a lot of individuals and families that were being displaced. And we provide services globally around the world, primarily to refugees. Our office is located in Sacramento. We have also been providing services to human trafficking survivors for over the last six years. So a lot of the information I'm sharing with you this morning, it's not just statistics and numbers, it also is about the reflection of the work that we've provided to survivors and what we've learned by working with them over the years. Again, I'm gonna talk about what the definition is, how to identify and how to assist. So the definition, I wanna be clear, this isn't Roger's definition of what human trafficking is. This is not the IRC's definition. And unfortunately, the exploitation of human beings is not something that's new to our generation. It's been going on since the beginning of time. Even here in the United States, unfortunately, people are being taken advantage of. And prior to 2000, there were social service agencies doing their part. Law enforcement were making arrests and trying to hold perpetrators accountable. And the court system was doing their part. But we weren't all on the same page. We weren't speaking the same language. So back in 2000, when we had a functioning federal government, largely based on a lot of work done by the United Nations, the federal government came up with what's called the AMP model and also funds that allow 
service providers to provide work and support survivors and provide funds to actually help survivors. So for an individual that is able to express to either law enforcement or social service provider that they've experienced three things that entitles them to all those different benefits that we'll be talking about. So it's pretty straightforward in, in the way that it's set out. The first letter is A is for action and a survivor needs to be able to express that they were either induced, recruited, harbored, transported, provided, or obtained. The M stands for means. So either through force, fraud, or coercion, they were engaging in some sort of activity. Now, if you've ever seen a news article on TV or maybe a really bad movie about the subject matter, usually people have a pretty clear understanding of what force and fraud looks like. Oftentimes people think that people are, are locked in cages or handcuffed to a bed, and that does happen. Fraud is really a, a very basic bait and switch situation. And again, I think one of the similarities with domestic violence and human trafficking is unfortunately that perpetrators use the tool of coercion. In this context, what I mean by coercion is again, getting someone to do something they wouldn't do of their own free will. I don't like to give perpetrators of this crime a lot of credit, but unfortunately they are very insightful people that oftentimes what they will do is whatever it takes, either by threats, by intimidation, whatever they need to say and do to keep that person engaged in an activity for their benefit, that's what perpetrators do. And what they're doing is they're forcing someone to engage in either sex for money or physical labor. I, I wanna clarify some language that I've used this morning. First, the person is doing this crime. I'm gonna remain professional this morning and I'm gonna call that person either the trafficker, the criminal, the bad person. And the person that's being exploited in this setting, I'm going to interchange two words. One is survivor and one is victim. Now, when I first started working in the field of domestic violence and sexual assault, the agencies used the word victim. A person is a victim of an assault, a person is a victim of a crime. And luckily, for the most part, that language has evolved. And I think survivor is a much more powerful word to use. So if you come across an individual that you either know or suspect, has experienced this crime, I would encourage you to use the word survivor. It's much more empowering. But with law enforcement and the criminal justice system, because they're working with penal codes and laws, it's not gonna be uncommon for those kind of agencies and programs to continue to use the word victim. So again, this morning, I may not be the best role model for you, but I do want you to understand why I interchange the word victim and survivor and encourage you to use the word survivor. What I also like to do is remind folks that potentially anybody can be a survivor of human trafficking. Unfortunately, there's a lot of misconceptions about this crime, but a lot of people in our society think that human trafficking is something that only happens over there, that it's happening in a foreign country, or that it only happens to those people. Unfortunately, this crime, like a lot of other crimes in our society, what happens is perpetrators select and choose victims that are most vulnerable. So it's the marginalized in our society. With our agency over the last six years, we've actually worked with an individual that was 74 years old that was being exploited in the construction industry. We worked with a young girl that was 12 years old and she was uh, actually exploited in both the sex industry and physical labor was being exploited. And again, that's what makes this topic so challenging is that potentially each and every client that you may have contact with may either currently be or has been a victim of this crime. So again, please set aside any myth or misconception that you may have that somehow that the person that you're working with can't be a survivor because they don't fit that category. Again, anybody can be a victim of this crime. As I mentioned earlier, the federal definition divides the crime in which survivors are quoted into two categories, labor trafficking and sex trafficking. Later on, Terry and Chrissy will give you a little bit more information about sex trafficking and the impact and resources that are available. But I'd like you to remember that it's estimated when we're talking about this subject matter globally, that labor trafficking is actually happening at a rate three times greater than sex trafficking. So for that reason, my part of the presentation this morning is really gonna focus a little bit more about labor trafficking. 
But I do want to acknowledge that sex trafficking happens. And this is the only time I will do it today, I promise, is I'm going to give you a Roger opinion. I personally believe that one form of exploitation is not better or worse than the other, and that no one should be subjected to the abuse and power and control that is subject over them by their perpetrators. And hopefully perpetrators are held accountable for their actions. So that's my belief. With sex trafficking, what I want to share with you is the different venues in which someone can be exploited. What I'm sharing with you is one of the resources that's going to be provided later today, and that's the national hotline number. And what they did is they tracked the calls that came in to that number. Now, this chart doesn't tell us who was calling in. It doesn't say if this is service providers or potential survivors of human trafficking, but simply the location of which the calls were about. And as you can see, about 10% of the calls were regarding hotels and motels. 10% of the calls were regarding things that were happening in local massage parlors and spas. And unfortunately, the internet, even though it allows us the opportunity to provide this training to you today, it is also a way in which perpetrators that want to purchase sex are doing so. And again, this is with individuals as young as 13, 14 years old. Also another trend that we see both nationally and locally is individuals purchasing residences. Then they come in, they bring several individuals and they start selling sex out of that house. So what we used to call a brothel is actually now operating in both very affluent neighborhoods and neighborhoods that struggle. In addition to that, they track the calls that came in regarding labor trafficking. As you can see, about 20% of the calls was regarding domestic work. Domestic work in this context, to be clear, is work that we hire someone to come in and do in our house. So it's watching our kids, being a nanny, cleaning our house, being a personal chef, all those great things that could be nice that we could hire someone to come in and do in our household. In addition to that, about 12% of the calls were regarding agricultural exploitation. Traveling sales crews was about 10% in the restaurant industry. One of my first presentations was down in Vacaville and one of the audience members shared with me that there was a local restaurant that had been in that community for over a decade. And the owner was re recently discovered that during the day he had a cook and a, and a dishwasher that was doing those tasks. But then overnight, he forced those two same employees to be security guards in which he wasn't compensating them. And again, I think that's the challenge with human trafficking in general, but specifically labor trafficking is it's happening in industries and businesses that you and I solicit because we don't know how employers are treating their employees behind closed doors. And then lastly, you can see about 4% of the calls was regarding uh, exploitation that was help, happening in nail salons and beauty salons. Again, I want to stress this is a, a global issue and one that's happening here in the United States. And again, the national hotline, what they did is they tracked the bottom of calls that came in. The greater the number of calls, the brighter the color. Now, what I don't want you to do is at the end of this training is go home, pack your bags and move to Nebraska, Wyoming, Nevada, or even Idaho, thinking that people are not being exploited there. They are. It's just the population in those states is less than other states. And also, too, the awareness is not as great. So to me, it's a positive thing that people, especially here in the state of California, are aware of resources and are getting connected to those resources. So now that we have a, a very basic understanding of what human trafficking is, what I'd like to do is give some insight to potentially identifying survivors. But before we do that again, I think it's important to keep in mind the other part of the equation. And just like with domestic violence, we have perpetrators, and I think it's important to understand the uh, perpetrator. I think it's important to understand traffickers. So I'd like you for just a moment, think about who a trafficker is and think about the connection between that trafficker and their victim. Not necessarily what the trafficker looks like, but again, the connection. Oftentimes, when we think about traffickers, again, based on very limited interactions and understanding of the subject matter, I think the first thought is it's a stranger, that it's this perpetrator that's driving around in an unmarked van, pulls up to an individual that's walking along in a park, pulls that victim into the van, drives off, and starts exploiting them. Sadly, that has, does happen, but likely that's very rare. 
more than likely there's a connection between the victim and the perpetrator. One increased connection that we've seen at the IRC over the last six years is organized crime. There are individuals that are exploiting victims. And one example is a client that we worked with, I'll call him George, that was 16 years old, that was forced to come to a specific location every day, pick up a backpack, take that backpack to an address and come back within a certain amount of time. And if they didn't do so, either he or his family members would be harmed. It's employers, like I talked about earlier, but it's also people that are victims from individuals they have a relationship with. It's boyfriends and girlfriends. It's individuals that manipulate and encourage their significant others to engage in something for money to support that relationship. And then that boyfriend or girlfriend will threaten that victim that if they don't continue to engage in that activity, something will happen to them either physically or emotionally. So it happens with boyfriends, girlfriends, spouses, and sadly, even family members. It can be aunties or uncles, it can be parents, and very similar to domestic violence, it can be intergenerational, where you can have a survivor that was exploited when she or he was young, they grew up and have children of their own, and then unfortunately they choose to turn around and exploit their own children. And it happens to foster kids. Again, with family situations and dynamics, we encourage and hope that parents were really supporting and, and being there for their children. But unfortunately, instead of doing that, they turn around and exploit their own children. Again, either through the foster care system or their biological children. Some things to look for. Again, a lot of similarities with domestic violence that you'll look, hear from Jamie later on when we present is that if you have a survivor that's acting very anxious or very fearful, not able to provide eye contact when you're having a discussion with them. Obviously, when you're doing screenings, you would never want to have two people in the room because that, again, will not allow the survivor to potentially express to you what's actually going on. Also, two individuals that live and work within the same location, as I shared with you, what was happening at that restaurant. Or also, two, if you have individuals that express that they work really long hours. Now, sure, all of us in this field work some pretty long hours, but our employers follow state and federal laws, so they provide either overtime pay or some sort of compensation for our long days. Again, perpetrators of this crime don't follow those same rules. So if you have an individual that's sharing with you that they work six, seven days a week, working 10, 12 hours, again, potentially that can be an indicator. Some screening questions that are helpful to help identify individuals is, is someone forcing you to engage in sex or physical labor against your will? Does that survivor have access to their IDs? Are they able to come and go freely? Are you forced to pay off a debt to your employer? And again, things that we think about has, have been removed from our society, the debt bondage that we learned about in our history books, unfortunately continues to happen today. And then it's not only asking, is someone threatening to harm you? But also please remember to ask, is someone threatening to harm either you or your family members, because is, again, perpetrators are gonna use whatever tools and power they have over that individual to keep them in their place. So it's not just the victim we need to check about their safety, but that person's immediate family too. When we do give survivors a safe place to express themselves, what we learn is that oftentimes they've been isolated. That constant supervision, that eye of the perpetrator over them, just like with domestic violence, is something that really keeps them in these situations, not just weeks or months, but potentially years and decades. Also, most individuals don't know what their rights are. As employees, people don't know that they're entitled to two breaks and a half hour lunch. And they don't know if that isn't happening to them, what agencies and programs are available to support them. Another chilling effect that we've seen over the recent years, unfortunately, is the distrust of law enforcement. And this is true of not just individuals that are from foreign countries where law enforcement is not safe, but even for U.S. citizens, either because of their own personal experience or their community's experience, they may fear that if they come forward that they're going to have to work with law enforcement. Luckily, that's not the case, but again, that is a real fear that survivors have. And again, it's the fear of the unknown, that when the survivor does come forward, they've been told over the years that there's going to be major contributions retribution to either themselves or their loved ones. So it's the, the unknown of what will happen next. Uh, again, our survivors expressed to us 
the living conditions that they've been in, how they were exploited sometimes both the labor trafficked and they've been exploited sexually, and that they didn't have access to their documents. And it's again, really important to provide survivors a safe place to express themselves and to be able to convey this information in a way that's comfortable for them and that is received in a non-judgmental way. There's some myths that are still out there. One confusion that a lot of community members have is that an individual has to be smuggled into this country. Smuggling and human trafficking are two totally different crimes. Smuggling is crossing either a state or a nation's border without proper documentation. Again, as I shared with you earlier, the crime of human trafficking does not have that requirement. Another myth that hopefully we're dispelling today is that survivors are gonna express that they were locked in cages or handcuffed to a bed. Again, that might be something that someone's experienced, but again, the vast majority of perpetrators of this crime use the tool of coercion, the tool of the mind games and the verbal abuse, not necessarily the physical abuse. Also too, some people think that survivors are going to self-disclose that they're a victim of this crime. Again, working in this field for almost 25 years, I have yet to hear of a caseworker whose first words that they heard from their client was, I'm a survivor of human trafficking help. Again, it's gonna be, my employer is not treating me properly. They're not paying me the rate that they promised. And I can't leave that work environment. Or it might be my boyfriend or girlfriend is forcing me to engage in sex for money. And I don't wanna do that. That is gonna be the verbiage that I would encourage you to listen for. And then you can educate that individual about their experience fitting the definition of human trafficking. Another myth is out there that this is only a crime that happens in underground industries like the selling of drugs or the selling of firearms. Again, unfortunately, human trafficking happens in mom and pop operations and multi-billion dollar corporations. Some people in our society think that if someone isn't here with documentation, they kind of get what they deserve. Well, luckily, it doesn't matter what you and I think about it. Luckily, the state and federal laws say that employers have to treat their employees humanely and really honor the agreement that they've made with that employer and employee. So it's important that even if someone doesn't have documentation or doesn't have a, a, a feeling that they're, they're being treated in a way that is right, again, it doesn't matter what that employer thinks. It really is laws that they have to follow. And with human trafficking, especially with labor trafficking. It's not only the crime of human trafficking that is being broken, but also labor laws are oftentimes being broken too. And then lastly, this is a crime again that only happens to those people, especially those individuals that are here from another country, or maybe those individuals that don't have documentation. Again, that's not the case. And as we'll discuss later on, this is a crime that happens to both foreign born individuals and US citizens. Lastly, what I'd like to do is shift the conversation and, and lead into what Terry and Christy will be talking about is how to assist survivors of these crimes. And one resource that you have locally is our program. To refer a client, simply you could call us and we could start that process of engaging with that individual. We can also be reached by email. Again, we're not 24 seven operation, but simply by contacting us starts that process. Because we're not available 24 seven like WEAVE and other agencies and programs, another resource I'd like to share with you is that there is that national hotline number. So if you're an agency or program that you're working with someone and it's three o'clock in the morning, you can call the national hotline number or text them and they will give you information and support and connect you to local resources. And then lastly too, if this information is helpful and you'd like this to be the beginning of the process of learning more about the subject matter, we provide free trainings. So you can contact me directly either by sending me an email or, or calling me and I'd be happy to provide more information to either you individually or the program in which you work. And with that, I wanna go ahead and shift this, the conversation over to Terry and Christy to give more information about human trafficking and especially with a different focus than the IRC's services and programs. You should have uh, co-host options now. Right. 
I do not see it. Hi everyone, we're just getting my slides up um, so I can move through them. Hi everyone, nice to nice to see most of your guys' faces. <laughs> and Anika, I don't mind saying next slide at all. If it's if it's easier, I'll just when we come to the end of the slide, I can say next slide, no problem. Sure. Um, let's one moment. Well, I'll get started. I am Terry. I am the executive director here at CASH. And our mission is to assist women who've been commercially sexually exploited through survivor-led peer support and harm reduction services while providing education about the harm inflicted on women in the community. Um, I read you our mission statement because how we do this work, how we work with women who have been trafficked is contained in our mission statement. And so in our presentation, we'll talk a little bit more about those elements. I do wanna talk about um, our founding. We, we do have a unique founding. Um, we, ca we came into being because of a collaborative effort between um, POP officers with Sacramento, um, the Sacramento Police Department, a business association, professors at Sac State, and women involved in the sex trade. They came together because it was clear that there were no dedicated services to women who were being commercially sexually exploited. And that this was a gap in the way we were able to help women who had very high service needs um, and that there wasn't a place where they felt that they could receive services while being honest about what was going on in their background. Um, when they asked what was most needed to help women make, a cha make changes they wanted to make in their life, the two things that were the most important that came up repeatedly was housing, which is why I'm excited to present here to people who are all talking about housing and where we are today, and a safe place, a safe, non-judgmental place that was dedicated to women who've been commercially sexually exploited. And so we've been working on those two things that came from that work group from women who were involved since 2008. Um, when we say commercially sexually exploited, we mean women who have been trafficked, who have survived trafficking, who are fleeing trafficking. We also mean women who sell sex um, for a variety of other reasons, women who sell sex because they need their basic needs met, women who sell sex because they have an addiction or because they're involved in the sex trade and they, they would still like assistance. So we serve women and that's any, obviously any woman who identifies as a woman um, that fits that criteria. So we don't only run anti-trafficking programs. Um, and so Christy will let you know the variety of things that we do um, offer from our center. Next slide. Hi all, um, so Opening Doors um, was one of our first uh, collaborative, um, you know, all inclusive uh, um, wraparound um, services that we started offering here, um, a, a program and it started in 2016. And with that, it was, it's a program for women that have been trafficked um, it did not have to happen in Sacramento. They just have to have trafficking in their background. And um, we, we walk with them through um, helping them find a safe and stable, you know, life and creating that. 
And um, what that entails is um, intense case management. So with a survivor, we, all of us at CASH, except for Terry, are survivors, um, which is, you know, very important. We will get to that. And so with case management, the, the goals that we really work on are making sure that people um, have their identification documents, because normally um, that's a barrier to housing, you know, if they don't have their social security card or birth certificate. So right when we enroll a person, you know, we want to start working on that. Um, also connecting them to trauma-informed uh, medical care with uh, Mercy Family Health Center. Um, therapy, they could see a therapist here. And then housing, um, which is a big piece of it. Because to be able to work with a person, it's very helpful to be able to, um, you know, have them stably housed so that we can work on things. We know where to go and pick them up and that their safety is met. And so um, we have a few different options for housing. We, we work with, uh, we partner with a few programs. So City of Refuge, um, Mothers in Healing and Freedom Through Education. And with that, we're able to have them housed there for up to four months. And having a person housed for four months gives us a lot of time to be able to, you know, meet all the basic needs and, um, you know, help a person just become safe and, and stable. And, um, and then sometimes we're also able to help with uh, rental assistance as well. And so with our opening doors program, um, 69 women enrolled in this program last year, and that was a 51% increase since 2017. And so there's, there's a lot of need, right? There's um, every year we enroll more and more people. Um, while that program, you know, is for people that have been trafficked, all of our other programs are for people that have um, also been trafficked, but uh, survival sex as well, and, you know, um, sex work on their own. And some of those programs are my program. I work with victims of crime, and we, um, I do comprehensive case management and all of the same things as the Opening Doors program. We also have a recon program. It is a nine-week uh, employment readiness program that really looks at barriers uh, to employment and addressing those, you know, and then, um, you know, just to, to help a person be able to walk through getting a job and all of that. It's been very successful. We also have uh, healthy women and families because a lot of the, the women that we serve, they're either pregnant or parenting. And so we have a, a program for that that helps link them with, you know, community resources, um, you know, and just making sure that they, they are prepared for baby. Um, Yolanda runs that program and even after like a person just had a baby, she, she'll even go and hold the baby so that the, the mom could go take a shower, you know, um, just really, really great resources. And all of those things happen in our drop-in center. So our drop-in center is open uh, Monday through Friday, one to five. And that is for anybody that wants to come in. We have condoms everywhere. Um, they can watch Netflix. They can get something to eat. They can talk to somebody. So those are some of our services. And then, uh, so 67% of all participants self-identify as having trafficking in their background. And that's for all of our, you know, services. Next slide. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit now about, in general, supporting people who have been trafficked. Um, I want to uh, touch back to one of the statistics that Ro Roger um, said about labor trafficking and sex trafficking, and he had 68% of people labor trafficked and 22% um, sex trafficked. Interestingly, when we look at the 2019 data from the national hotline of callers who have called in, it's almost exactly reversed. There's 65% that are called in for sex trafficking and 22% for labor trafficking. And I bring that up not because Roger's numbers are wrong or my numbers are wrong. It's because when we look, we tend to find trafficking. When we open up access and resources, 
we tend to find people who step forward with this experience. It has been incredibly hidden. People are not willing to come forward and talk about it easily by no means, regardless of how it came to be. That is something we, those of us who work in this field know very, very well. It is not going to be the person who's going to raise their hand and say, I really want to talk about this. But when we open up access and when we're looking for trafficking, we are finding it in many, many individuals' backgrounds. Um, and specifically, one of the things I want to talk about in Sacramento County is that we have a lot of services or we have services for women. And so we tend to speak a lot about sex trafficking and women, but we know for a fact that men are sex trafficked. And so I want to make sure that you leave this training understanding that the person sitting in front of you, male or female, sex or labor, domestic, foreign, this is something that many people have in their background. Um, and our services in Sacramento are not, at, not geared towards male survivors as much as um, they should be or could be. So I just wanna make sure that we cover that part. Um, next is the housing piece. Um, Christy talked about housing. I mentioned that um, housing was the first need when we did a needs assessment um, that was mentioned. And what we need in housing is immediate housing that's low barrier that's safe, that's flexible, and that is trauma-informed. And that's a big list. And, you know, we're bringing a lot of housing online right now um, through a lot of different sources, um, but it is really hard to hit that spot where um, the women that we've worked with, the people that we've needed to house, that we can find that mix of services that is also available that's immediate. Um, so that is a, an ongoing challenge. What we know is that most of the women we serve, when they come to us, they've not been put in HMIS. They've, they're not part of the continuum of care. They're not linked into the various housing resources that may be available. Um, and that's something that we're working with. Um, Sacramento Steps Forward and others, and Stacy mentioned that there is now um, new movement towards having a separate section for, for survivors. And I think that's all very helpful. That has come online really just this year. So historically, we've had um, really not sufficient housing or pathways for survivors um, to access the housing that they need. Um, when we ask um, why people don't stay in places when, when they're placed in different, if they've tried different housing options, um, it's usually, it's a variety of reasons that fall into one of these, um, one of these reasons. It didn't feel safe. It was too much or too little. I mean, there's, everybody needs housing choice. Everybody needs choice. And then that goes to housing also. And that's something that we really see in the people that we serve, that they need a housing environment where they can actually feel comfortable in order to start doing the really heavy lift of the work that they want to do. Um, the other thing is that Jamie will cover all the dynamics of domestic violence and interpersonal violence. Um, and leaving sex trafficking is very similar where it is certainly not a straight path. People um, will make several attempts in many cases to leave. And this is because, as Roger mentioned, there are a lot of relationships that are exploitative. They, we have many women who have children with people who have exploited them. We have families that have exploited family members. We have tight-knit groups of people who, where there's exploitation. And so for all the reasons that it is hard to just simply leave a domestic violence or interpersonal violence relationship, it is similar in this case. And so that same understanding um, is, is really important when somebody steps forward and is struggling with leaving and not going back because it is a similar dynamic. Um, what we have found that helps um, is having that strong connection to um, many 
different services and medical care. We have noticed a strong measurable increase through our partnership with healthcare and women who receive physical and mental health care while receiving services tend to stay in services longer. Um, I had just one more point on that one, yes, <laughs> point number four. Um, the other thing that helps us support people is the fact that we use a survivor-led model and that we use mentoring as a method to help women see what's possible and that really collaboration is very much in our DNA. It's how we were founded and how we work with all of the agencies and people that, that we provide services with. Um, what we feel that everybody involved at one time is a good thing, not the, our habit of maybe helping people in sequence. We're gonna help you with this, then we're going to pass you to this person to help, and then we're gonna pass you along here. What we have found a more successful model is that we're all in there helping at the same time. Um, and that really can help set a foundation. Um, but I do want Christy to talk a little bit more about the role of peer mentoring and using survivors in our work. So next slide. So when a person walks in, you know, um, a lot of times they're, they're very guarded. And so, you know, when you're sitting down and talking to somebody, uh, I find it really helpful to be able to say, like, I am a survivor. There is no judgment. You know, I may not have had your exact experiences, but I have had, you know, experiences of my own in life. And one of the great things about cash is when a person walks in, we have photos of, you know, when, when we weren't doing so great, a lot of them are our mugshots actually. Um, and then, you know, on the top of that, they, we have a picture, you know, of who we are today. And so when people see that, they could actually, you know, really know like, oh, wow, that's you, you know, normally they're shocked. Like, I can't even believe that. Um, but it really just like lets their guard down. And so, you know, we're able to like really have great conversations and work on things, um, you know, us working with a, with a person in conversation is going to be very different um, than their conversation. Like if they have a CPS worker, you know, they're, they're actually going to probably feel comfortable and be like, oh yeah, this, you know, bad thing happened yesterday because there, there is no judgment. There is no repercussion, you know, and it's a safe place. Um, some of the things that I'm really able to connect with people on um, from my experiences, um, I score very high on ACEs, which is adverse childhood experiences. Um, I, you know, I was homeless for seven years, starting at the, the age of 17. I had opiate and other addictions. I have, um, you know, successfully been successful on MAT, which is medication assisted treatments. Um, I've engaged in survival sex, uh, sex work on my own, and I have been trafficked, you know, and so, you know, that I'm, I'm an expert in those things. And a lot of the people that walk through these doors, you know, that need services have had, you know, at least one of those things. And so we're able to, to come together and, it, and it's great because they get to see a model, you know, of a person that is where they are now and that they have hope that they can, you know, get out of it and change their lives. Next slide. Um, I'm gonna talk about harm reduction, but I, I just want to say um, that I have the most amazing staff. Um, Christy's, Christy is amazing as all my staff, they, their passion for this work and their ability to be in there with people who are having similar experiences. Um, it is an amazing model that I'm happy to talk to anybody about how we do it. Um, we There's also a lot of staff support um, to ask people to be in an environment when they're doing this work this way. So we have really learned over time how to be successful with this model. And I am happy to share any of that information with anybody considering adding a peer support component to their work. Um, and as well as Christy and Swan and Yolanda, all of my staff would be happy to share anything that 
that we can. And we, we are real believers in doing work this way. Um, my last piece is harm reduction. Um, it was also in our mission statement and it is how we work with people. And we do this because harm reduction um, is a method that really helps reduce barriers that people will face when connecting with services, right? It creates opportunities for people to lead healthier lives from where they are today, this moment. And those steps of deciding to do something healthier this moment can lead to another step, which leads to another step, which can finally get us where we may, we may be going. Um, one way to think about harm reduction is that of course there is this safest course of action for many, many things that we do, right? There is the safest way that in general for all of us, we don't take just given any situation you might wanna think of. And then there's a safer way to be. It's somewhere in between. There is something safer we could be doing that's certainly using condoms, um, that is using needle exchange. That is a million ways that you can do something safer than you might be doing it if you had access and the knowledge. So that's part of the role of harm reduction is providing access and information so people can choose safer. Another example is making sexual and reproductive services very, very accessible. Christy mentioned we have condoms. We probably put more condoms out in Sacramento County than almost anybody else. Um, we get them by boxes and boxes. We have them everywhere. We hand them out everywhere. We, um, we, we give them to people. We have our service groups, um, wonderful women in their 70s and 80s making packages that have condoms in them because they understand harm reduction because we have talked to them about it. Um, it is really part of what we do. And we do that even when people are in unsafe relationships, even when their behaviors are unsafe, that, that is not related to our desire for them to be able to choose safety. And the final thing is that we all work under outcomes and goals and objectives. Um, those of BDs on there on the call and fund, fund developers on the call, it is the world that we write, but we work with people, right? And so it's really important and that we make space for people to take a healthier step and to celebrate that, to acknowledge that role in achieving goals and outcomes and that people do have power. And when we give them that power to choose to do something more safely than they're doing it, and we believe that that leads to them having safer lives, it's all a win. We get to goals and outcomes. Um, but we do it in a way that honors that people do have their individual power, which is incredibly important when you're working with survivors, with people who have been trafficked um, and people with, from, with domestic violence in their background, when power has been the thing that has been taken from them and wielded against them, every single time we can honor people's individual power, we are going to do the right thing. And I like to say we are all harm reductionists. Because if you wear a seatbelt or a bike helmet or you put sunscreen on, it's, those are examples of harm reduction. So um, there's 132 people on this call. I think we are all harm reductionists, but there are specific ways we can really embed this in working with survivors. Um, the final thing we have really quick is our information and just some examples of the connections that we do have. Um, when we connect with people, in many cases, we do MOUs so that we can work um, in synergy with one another, that we, instead of just being a referral agency, that we're really working in connection. Um, and HRS, for example, they're here today doing HIV testing. I mean, we're very embedded it, with our partners, but here's our information. Christy and I are, are open to any collaborations and conversations. So please take our information and, and get back to us. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Terry and Christy and Roger. Uh, you all elevated really great points uh, and just great reminders around um, that it's not just women who are impacted by human trafficking, also men and uh, regardless of sex or gender, um, anyone can be affected. And then also it's, it's good to hear that it's important for our survivors to know that they have a space where they will feel like um, those who are supporting them and their resources um, 
can sympathize and empathize with their current circumstances and really appreciate that with cash as well as other organizations that are working in this space to ensure that that, um, that level of support is available to them. And so with that, for the next few minutes, Roger, Terry, and Christy will be taking questions from the group. And so please do feel free to uh, unmute yourself to ask your questions, post them in chat, we'll be checking them. Uh, we'll be scrolling through to see who's submitted questions. If you are uh, looking to verbalize your questions, we're gonna be also watching those raised hands. So ask away. whether it's uh, directed to all of our speakers or to a specific person. Can I ask a question? Sure, please go ahead. Um, so hi, my name is uh, Jennifer Martins. I work with El Hugar Mental Health Clinic. So we provide you know, mental health services to folks that are experiencing homelessness, but we also partner a lot with Shelter Inc. and with First Step Community Shelter. And what we're finding is we send our outreach team out to do orientations at the shelters that we do see a lot of women there that are reporting abused domestic violence, lots of complex, you know, experiences. And I'm wondering if you guys have any relationships with these shelters so that perhaps somebody can go on site to help support and provide resources to the folks there. Yes, actually, um, we got a call uh, last week from, um, what is it, First Step Communities? Um, and that was um, the first time that we have, you know, gone there. And so, yeah, we were able to, you know, go meet a, a, a lady. Um, and then I just, I just did hear about Shelter Inc. Um, and so me and my coworker, that's on our list. We, we are trying to do like um, more outreach to programs. Um, we go, you know, to take our flyers and, and try to talk to people. So, so we are working on both of those actually. I see Crystal, you have your hand raised. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I'm with the um, Sacramento Homeless Union in Sac Soup. And um, my question is, do you guys have a like 24 hour crisis line? And also, what are your um, referrals for like our men in the situation? So we we don't ha we don't have a 24 hour line. Um, we do receive um, we receive Sacramento based information from the national trafficking hotline. So if that number is called, then we are one of the organizations that will get the referral if we're the best fit. We do have, but Christy does have a, a work phone number that she'd be happy to give you. And we're, we're very accessible, but it's not a 24 hour line. Um, but, but we would love to partner with you um, in, in your outreach and the things that you're doing as well. Um, as far as making referrals to men, uh, for men, that's, that's really hard. I mean, we do have, have some organizations that, that serve uh, men in different capacities. So we do try to find those organizations or make referrals. But if I would love for people to put in the chat, if uh, we, can, we can get a list going right now, that would be awesome. So and thank you for asking, Crystal. And just to clarify with our program, the Bar uh, barriers to connect with our services are very low. Unfortunately, we're not a 24 seven operation too, but to refer clients, it can be as simple as picking up the phone with a client. You could refer a, a, by pleading a form online, which is uh, information that's being forwarded to this audience. And then lastly, sometimes two survivors may not want to connect at a certain time. So simply passing along information about when that survivor is ready to connect with our program, he or she can do that on their term. So that the connection point for us is relatively low, it's just uh, having a name and a way of getting in contact with a, a potential client. Are you calling on people or you could just chime in? Yes, um, go ahead. I see uh, Claudia and then I'll pass that off to Kyle and then share next. Thank you. So I was just curious. Um, I didn't hear much about a couple of, um, I don't know, maybe you want to say subsets of, uh, of our survivors. Um, I work uh, 
with the, some CSEC youth here in Sacramento County and with CPS. Um, and then I was also very curious about any like specific services for our LGBTQ community. So is that, is everyone kind of included in that or are there different programs that are specific to those groups? So for us, we work with women who are 18 and over. So we, we do not serve um, minors um, at our center, and but Capital Star does, and mm -hmm. that's an organization that we have partnered with and worked, worked collaboratively with to make referrals um, for uh, women, people who are under 18. Um, as far as LGBTQ um, and, youth, and youth, 18 to 24, um, we serve that population um, fully um, to the extent that, we're, that we can, and that's uh, women and people who identify as women. Um, but we do also have referral sources to the LGBTQ Center and other organizations okay. that uh, serve. And so we are always trying to link people to whatever communities make them have the widest support uh, services. So even when we're working with somebody, we're usually working with them in conjunction with uh, many other people who are also working with them. Okay. And I guess I should have been more specific when I said the CSEC youth, because I mean, there are some that are under 18, but also foster youth now extends through the age of 21 if you've opt into extended foster care. Yes, we have so, many, many women in, that we serve are in the extended foster care system. Okay. So it's just... and, and with our program, I'm really proud. We actually saw a trend, unfortunately, people under the age of 18 that were being exploited both sexually and physical labor. So we actually developed and created a new position. And uh, we actually provide services for people under the age of 18. And so it's a specific program. The referral process is exactly the same. We try to make it easier for both agencies and potential clients. So just simply connecting with us would start the process for that person to start receiving services. And just like Terry and her group, we have a really good working relationship with the LGBT Center here in the Sacramento region and utilize those different resources and connections we have too for very diverse populations. I think I it's think my turn. Her. Yes, oh, yes, sorry. go ahead, Kyle. Hi, everyone. Thank you. This is super informative. Um, I'm from Sacramento Covered, and we do um, outreach to people experiencing homelessness in, in a variety of programs that we have. But one of the biggest challenges that we see that I'm wondering if anyone on the panel has experience or advice for is if we're working actively with a couple where one of the people in the couple is being abused or exploited by their partner, yet they explicitly are not ready to leave at all. And for a variety of reasons that are all very valid, including their partner may be a protective factor for them on, on the street, even though they're trafficking them or hurting them in other ways, it still is, um, there's still safety and protective things happening in the partnership. So, and and both of those individuals in the couple are our clients. So we're trying to serve both of them. And it's a super scary and confusing and morally upsetting thing to try to serve both of them together. And I'm just, I've, we've done many trainings and never really been able to get any guidance on how to actively work with a couple when this type of thing is going on. And I'm wondering if anyone has any experience or um, advice for us around that. So thank you. So one of... Um... Christy mentioned that all of our programs are out of our center for women. Now we wouldn't be able to serve the couple, but um, we have we have many instance similar instances where there is um, there is exploitation going on or there is violence going on in the with the couple, but the woman still is able to come to the center, um, largely because she's able to take food. She's able to like it's very resource. Um, rich. So she's able to come and then we're able to practice harm reduction. We're able to talk to her about safety. We're able to get her, um, you know, help her in the way that we can help her without her having to make a change to her living situation because it's not, it's just not time for that or she's not able. Um, so she's welcome. Anybody in that situation is welcome to come to the center. And we often have women um, who are, they're living in cars or RVs with people and that's their housing. The situation is not ideal for them. And this is very common for people to have to make these type of decisions. So we, they are absolutely able to come to our center. It is a, a no barrier uh, center for women where there's lunch, there's 
a place to clean up, there's clothes, there's harm reduction, supplies and information. So um, that we are able to do that. Does that help at all? I mean, it's, 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 it is a hard situation until they're able to get somewhere where both people can be worked with, um, but we are certainly able to receive the woman. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure I think I saw several questions in chat. Uh, please feel free to um, verbalize yeah. those and add on. Um, well, I asked several questions, but first I'd like to say that I, I volunteer with the Women Empowerment Program on their nine week program. I'm a mentor to the women. I've been doing it uh, for as long as I'm in uh, Sacramento, about three years. I'm, I hail from New York. Um, and uh, I am with the Business Professional Women from local to international. And we, uh, in California, we have, uh, uh, I'm vice chair for public policy. So we are fighting and voicing our views for human trafficking. I just wanted to mention that. And uh, I, I feel like it would be an awesome thing if I could have uh, either of you, Chrissy or, or um, you know, uh, any of you really who could speak to it. Um, I asked the question, what if there were percentages uh, or studies about like the percentage of men who were trafficked as compared to women? Um, and uh, I, I just, um, I feel I'm really happy to see that there are more than one agency who are working on this sort of thing. In New York, I was on a domestic violence board for about 18 years, six of those as president and a uh, mental health board. So I, I get that. I'm new to the uh, continuum of care uh, system um, performance committee. So I'm looking to working and voicing and helping as best as I can on this topic. Uh, I have a passion for it and wish to, to do the best I can as an individual to help all of you doing the work. Um, are you, uh, are you um, federally funded or state funded or is it an, a, per, um, a nonprofit on its own, your, your organization? Who are, who are you asking? All uh, of us? Terry, yeah. Um, so I like to say we are generally poorly funded, but <laughs> so we are gen a, a small nonprofit. Um, we are funded uh, by, we don't get any federal funding. We do get some state funding. Um, and then we do foundations where your typical nonprofit, um, mm -hmm. get, you know, funded by a variety of sources. Yeah. And with our agency, we are federally funded through the Department of Homeland Security and also the Office of Victims of Crime. And I really, I think this is a great reflection of the community that we do have here in the Sacramento region that there are multiple agencies and programs like CASH and WEAVE and the RSC and, and uh, numerous ones within the region that we all work well together. Sometimes there are challenges with funding and not wanting to duplicate services, but I, I think that is a positive thing that we have going in our communities that we do relatively work well together and support each other and really focus on the needs of our clients. Thank you. Hello, my name is I.E. Carter. I work with UC Davis Care Diagnostic and Treatment Center. And I love cash. I just want to say that I absolutely love cash. Thank you for your presentation. And um, I'm glad to know about the other um, Roger Freeman's program as well. But I had a question regarding, because I work with families and um, families or mothers with children, um, both the foster care side and also homeless um, families experiencing homelessness. And, um, and a lot of times when I'm doing like intakes with them, a lot of them mention um, being um, um, experiencing domestic violence or history of domestic violence or sex trafficking. And how does that work when they come with a, with a um, not, not the father, but just the, the mother with the children and some of their children sometimes are ages 15, 16, and they're males. And um, so how does that work with them being able to um, utilize services with cash? Christy, do you wanna take that? Yes, um, so, so luckily one of, one of our um, newer housing partners um, actually does accept, um, you know, 15 year old, uh, 
female, um, I have not asked them, you know, about, about, I have not had a client come in that, you know, had an older son yet. Um, but yes, just, just recently we were able to, um, accommodate somebody, um, with a, with a child that age, which is wonderful because in the past, you know, a lot of places they'd, um, some won't take, uh, children over six or 12, especially, um, young boys um so so we have made a, a new partner that um you know will will work with and house um older children or teenagers and with our program i do want to acknowledge that we do work with youth and sometimes it is a challenge for the caseworkers because our focus really is meeting the needs of the client that we're working with in that case it would be the youth and not the parent so navigating the rights of, that the parent has trying to support them and give them information, but really focusing on the needs of our client can be a challenge, but we do, again, with the adult, connect them with services that would be appropriate for them to get the support they need, even though they are necessarily the survivor themselves. As a loving, supportive parent, getting them connected with support in the community is really important too. Thank you. All right, we'll hand it off to Melissa, then Deborah, and then back to Crystal. And just a quick pause here. If you don't have any questions for our, president, for our presenters, we will be um, going into a short break soon. And so please feel free to step away if you need to do so. Uh, we have, we've been receiving some great questions. So I'll hand it back to Melissa now. Hey everybody, I just wanted to put a, a plug for the Capital Star CSET program that Terry had mentioned. So we do in Sacramento County have a program that does serve youth who are experiencing exploitation. So um, I just shared with um, Catherine that I'll share the information that'll get circulated um, after this training. So they do serve youth who are experiencing exploitation uh, 12 to 21 years old. Um, so that is an available resource in Sacramento as well. Thank you, Terry, Christy, and Roger for your presentation. It's been really, really helpful. Deborah, please go ahead. Hello, good afternoon, you guys. My name is Deborah Cummings. I am a steering committee with a uh, reduction of African-American child death that is black call, uh, called Black Child Legacy Campaign. I am an advocate for third party homicide and I am also the co-founder of Community Mothers of 9583815. I advocate in the community that I stay in that is Del Paso Heights. What we are experiencing here in our community is I am 25-8. That means we advocate services 24 hours, seven days a week. My problem is the advocating that we're doing, it always, just like anybody else, the problem that we experience is housing. But for our services is we're really, really having a problem with our teens, you know, and uh, the trafficking and things like that. I have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a lot of our teens here, right in the community which I live in, you know, and the trust factor with some of our uh, pregnant teens, you know, it, it, it gets really, really tricky. So my thing is, how can we uh, advocate with that teenage mom that's right here in our community, but that's really, really like unstable with her house thing. She's kind of like uh, having a situation where she's torn. She don't know if she want to stay in the same situation. That's unhealthy, you know, and then, you know, how do we bring all these resources together really, really on a, a, a crucial, you know, uh, how should I say, bring all the resources together, like in a crisis situation, like maybe 12, one o'clock at night. That's the problem that I'm having. The resources are very limited. And we really advocate late night. So I guess what I'm trying to say is those services, are they available? So if I want to make a call, can I pick up a phone and get a number to somebody maybe 10, 11 p.m. at night? So I think when Jamie presents and she'll probably um, give good information about their 24 hour services uh, through Weave and what they offer. Um, so stay tuned for that. 
we do not have the ability and okay. we are a small organization we do not have the ability to respond i understand exactly what you're saying and how you're saying that, that, that it's starting it, it's a crisis time um but the best we can do is first thing the next morning i mean you certainly can reach out but we don't have um 24 hour staff or the ability to to respond at that hour but deborah i would love for you to come to the center and to come see talk to us and um see what we can do together or what we, how we can help at all. So my email uh, was on the presentation. Um, so I would love to, to talk some more. And Deborah, great, my great was, left. response is very similar to Terry's that we are not a 24 seven operation, but luckily because our focus for over the last 20 years has really been a, a resettling of refugees in this region. So we have a lot of great connections. So with our clients, we don't offer temporary emergency shelter but actually long-term housing solutions. So again, I would okay. put the same offer that Terry and Jamie, anybody in this field, hopefully is giving to you as a, a chance to connect and see how we can partner up and maybe have a more larger impact in your community that you're working so hard in currently. And the reason why I say this, because what we're trying to do just in our community, I don't know about a lot of other people, but I am in district two, and we're one of the most underserved community there is here in Sacramento. I'm just going to be honest, but moving forward on a positive note, I'm just trying to create a crisis emergency response book that I can carry with me when I'm out in the field. You know, I'm the co-lead, so I wanna make sure that I can have them, even if it's the very next morning, I still have that information in my book. So this is great for me. I, you know, I, I'm new to, to the Steps Forwards program, but, you know, I'm very linked in the community, but just knowing the extra layers on top of layers that we need to collaborate with is key for me. So, yeah. All of us. So worth coming to the center, any one of you, I would love to come and check it out. Thank you. Thanks, Deborah and um, our presenters. Crystal, I'll hand it back to you and then Jennifer. All right, just super quick. And it kind of goes off of what Deborah was just saying. Um, a lot of what we see in the encampments is people wanting to escape pimps and they are not able to. Um, and so I guess where my concern comes in is I know I understand like that women can come into the center, but is there that resourcing if, if I was a woman being trafficked and say, hey, I want out of this situation immediately. Um, is there somewhere for people to go to get away? Because we know when people seek help, um, if they're caught seeking help, that often can be deadly to some women. Um, and then the other question I had really quick is, are you guys co connected to the Polaris Project at all? say that again the project the project the Polaris project oh um is, is, yeah well we are as far as the human trafficking uh, hotline that's part, a part of the Polaris project and so if that if an if somebody reports calls that number and through their screening process we're the right referral it'll come to us it also can go to opening doors and go to weave my sister's house there's a number of us that are re we receive those referrals but they decide which uh service you know who to contact um so we we are yes um so that is a possibility um as far as if we have immediate hand placement sometimes we do i mean it, it would be really i want you and christy to connect uh crystal because of how you're talking about the seriousness of the situation, we would want to make sure that we had a potential place before anybody attempted to leave if it was very unsafe for them to do so. So we would want to talk about that in advance. But because we do work with housing providers, um, again, I want to make sure everybody hears that we're very small and our, and, and our work here in Sacramento is small, but in many cases, we can place people. Um, so I just really would love for us to connect um, so that you can call us and we can talk through things like that because the answer is um, is often we might be able to step in. With us, just to let you know, we are part of both Polaris and also the Freedom Network. And then the rapid rehousing uh, portion of our services are available too. So we are able to identify both short-term housing and long-term housing for our programs. And again, it is definitely a challenging time for all of our different organizations and agencies dealing with housing, but that is part of our uh, goal is to find safe housing for the clients that we work with. Please go ahead, Jennifer. 
Um, I just wanted to share, so something that we have seen work out with folks that are escaping, you know, domestic violence or whatever the case, um, I've been able to connect a couple of people to crisis respite just to get them indoors somewhere. And then following that, we have been able to use MHSA funds to get people into a room and board within about 24 hours and then use those funds to help them sustain placement for the next three to four months so we can work on strategies to help them, like, rebound. So just kind of by thinking a little bit outside of the box and being a little bit creative with crisis respite, with um, our own outreach support and the use of MHSA funds, we have been able to respond pretty quickly to some of these crisis environments. So um, I just wanted to share that. And Jennifer, we, we use crisis respite all the time also. I mean, that is definitely, we do the same, but I would love if you will put your, give me your email somehow, I'd like to talk about that next piece with you. Um, so that would be awesome. Okay, I guess we're all making some connections here. Cher, please go ahead. Oh, real quick, um, to Deborah's point, uh, working with youth in, in my career paid job in New York, I work with youth at risk. And, um, and so it, it was challenging, very challenging because it was a high intense group, traumatized kids, gang rape, things like that, all girls I worked with. And, um, and so we had uh, mobile mental health in New York. I don't know, maybe that's the crisis uh, group you, you just mentioned. Maybe it's the same thing, I don't know. But in the middle of the night during crisis, which happens mostly at night, we were, were able to call the mobile mental health and they have a staff of their own and they come and they you know, talk the kid down or whatever crisis is going on. Uh, outside of that, we use the police department a lot. They do us. And so they would help to, to calm and deflate the, you know, um, to, to um, bring the, the kid back to a place where we could have a discussion. Um, so I don't know if you have that mobile mental health or if that's the same as your crisis um, program that was just mentioned. I think Jennifer mentioned it. Do you do you have that to you know to regulate the, the client or if they're deregulated things like that? Well, I belong to a team that uh, we go out and we do deal with the uh, teens at their crisis you know situation. So we have trained staff that will come out and diffuse the situation so we can bring them down enough to where we can get the resources and the services that they're needed you know at that time. You know, because it happens a lot with our teenage youth, you know, in the wee hours. So it's just building that layer of resource network, you know, on the on, on the fly at night, because like you said, and, and I can totally agree, everything happens after 5 p.m. And it's just honest, you know, and like I said, I get more knocks on the door on my telephone call because I live in the community community that I serve. So it's like they will knock on my door at 1 a.m. So I, I just like to be ready with the uh, resources at hand because you just never know. And why waste time calling those numbers that not going to work? You know, I just need someone to pick up. And even if that resource is, is in the morning at 7 a.m., I'm on it first thing. So yeah, that's yeah. what I look for. But thank you. Uh, I have one more. Can I say one more thing? Um, Go ahead, Claudia. I was just thinking about, I also have, I also work with families who are undocumented. I have a client right now that, um, I did refer her to cash, so that was great, but I have two clients undocumented who have been victims of domestic violence or sex trafficking, and, um, and one has a, a language barrier, and, um, and it's hard to find safe places for them because there's no housing services for them, when you try to apply for any vouchers or anything, they're not eligible because they're not documented. So, and I know people had told me about Next Move, which the wait list to get into Next Move is super huge, super long. Are there any other resources for um, women with children um, for services with that particular situation? Our, our agency may be a good fit again, our, History of being in this field for over 100 years, helping refugees or folks that are 
uh, from another country with or without documentation. And so we could potentially provide services. So I would encourage um, you to maybe reach out to speak to one of our caseworkers to, to clarify, because again, each uh, individual is different and their needs are different, but we have a history of working with uh, a large portion of our clients in the past or folks that are here that are foreign born and we've helped them navigate both the legal system and also helping them getting connected to, to housing for them and their families. And is that the 916-208-7807 number? Or the, it was the main number. Um, I'll double check to make sure that I'm giving you the right number, but it will be within the documents that you, you'll be provided with the training. It's our main office number. And okay. opening doors works with um, undocumented yes. individuals, you know, and if they've been trafficked, they have a program for, for that. You so know. I did mention opening doors, but the wait list, for instance, I had a client last month that needed to get connected and open doors, they were filled up for the month of, and this was the middle of last month. Um, and they and they said sign up now for September. So I'm just curious if there's any um, there's anything that. But I'll reach out to you also, Roger. Um, and just but I just need to have your contact information. Just to I clarify, can. it is area code nine one six four eight two zero one two zero. That was the number. That's our main office number. Okay, thank and you. I, I just wanted to mention too. Hi, this is Jamie from Weave. Um, if someone is is trying to leave domestic violence, leave an abusive relationship and get safe. Um, our, our emergency housing programs and transitional housing programs, we do not ask for documentation status. So we definitely have undocumented survivors, families and singles um, who are staying in our residential programs that we, but I, I'll share more in a few minutes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. I, I was just getting ready to ask you about what your contact information, <laughs> thank you. All right, everyone, thank you so much for your questions. Please keep them coming. Please put them in chat. We are now going into our next portion of the training, which is domestic violence. So um, I'd like to introduce you all to Jamie Garrick, who is the Chief Program Officer of Counseling and Outreach at Weave in Sacramento. Weave is the region's widely respected provider of services for survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, in sex trafficking in is Sacramento County's Soul Rape Crisis Center. Jamie has worked in the fields of domestic violence and sexual assault for over two decades. Her passion is ensuring trauma-informed services for survivors and their families and providing domestic violence and sexual violence prevention education for all ages. I'd also like to take a moment to introduce to you our, uh, for our discussant for today which uh, who is Caitlin DeChico, who earned a degree in sociology from Sonoma State University and master's in social work from California State University, Sacramento. During her time at Sac State, she specialized in working with children and families, serving diverse vulnerable populations in schools throughout the Sacramento area and conducting research, evaluating the program for commercially exploited women in the Sacramento region. Caitlin oversees the Employee Plus Empower program with Three Strands Global Foundation, which provides intensive case management and work readiness services to survivors of human trafficking and vulnerable populations in the greater Sacramento region. And with that, I uh, hand it over to Jamie, who you should have um, host permissions now. Okay, it'll take me a second here, folks. Let me see if I can... Okay, I think we got it going. Let me make sure, yes. Okay, great. Hi everyone, uh, I'm so happy to be here and thank you for inviting Weave to be at this training. Uh, my name is Jamie uh, and um, I am looking forward to spending the next hour with you talking about domestic violence and hope that um, we can get to everyone's questions too, if any questions come up from the presentation. Uh, I do want to start here in terms of saying that we provide services for everyone, so all relationships, all genders, all ages, all people, and all the time. Um, again, my name is Jamie, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. I do want to start with a little bit of information about Weave real quick. Just Weave's mission is to promote safe and healthy relationships and support survivors of sexual assault, domestic violence, and sex trafficking. 
Uh, Weave has been around since 1978, and um, it was actually started in 1978 by three Latina domestic violence survivors who were experiencing domestic violence in their own lives. And uh, they started Weave in 1978. And so we've been around for lots of decades now and have grown quite a bit, definitely over the, over the decades. Um, I will definitely share with you about all of Weave's services um, at the end of the presentation. And I'm gonna do the best I can here with getting all of this information in a very short amount of time. If I'm talking too fast, please let me know, okay? Because I do tend to do that because I'm so excited about wanting to share this with you but I, I wanna make sure I'm not talking too fast here. Um, in terms of what we're going to be talking about today, we are gonna be looking at what is domestic violence uh, so we can really define it. We're gonna look at the dynamics of an abusive relationship and its impact. Uh, learning about that, especially as a helper, is really important in terms of providing trauma-informed care to really understand what domestic violence is and what the dynamics are in the relationship. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the intersection of domestic violence and homelessness, uh, learn how to respond in a trauma-informed way, and also learn about WEAVE services. Um, we have just talked about uh, human trafficking. Now we're talking about domestic violence. Uh, both are very difficult topics that really touch all of us in some way. Um, and so I really hope that all of you are taking care of yourself and doing what you need to do to take care of yourself during this presentation and also after uh, talking about trafficking and domestic violence is difficult. And like I said, many of us are impacted personally and professionally by it. And so please take care of yourselves and do what you need to do. Um, and in terms of what we're going to hopefully cover and after this presentation is that Hopefully all of you will recognize the signs of abuse and domestic violence, um, respond in an empathic and trauma-informed way, and we'll talk about WEAVE services so that you can refer survivors for help and, help and uh, resources. Um, I do want to start with the statistics here just so that everyone you know, understands how pervasive it is when we're talking about domestic violence. Um, it impacts uh, more than 12 million people every year. One in three women, one in four men, two in five gay men, one in three lesbians, one in two trans folks, and one in three teens have been victims of abuse by an intimate partner. It is pervasive. If you have not been impacted directly by domestic violence, I'm sure you know someone who has. Um, it is pervasive. It impacts all of us. It is not something that's out there um, that happens to other people. It happens right here with us, right? Um, over 15 million children uh, witness domestic violence annually, and it has a huge impact on kids growing up in domestic violence. We work with a lot of kiddos that we, um, both in our residential programs and in counseling. Uh, we, uh, I'll go into more of those services a little bit later in the presentation. Um, one out of four emergency room visits for violence are due to domestic violence. Again, this is not something we talk about, just like trafficking, domestic violence is often a very hidden uh, very hidden and we don't talk about it. But if you think about one in four people who walk into um, a Kaiser emergency room today for a violence related injury, one in four of those folks, uh, that violence related injury was, uh, was from their partner. Uh, and so we often don't talk about that, but it's really important to understand that intersection between um, domestic violence and how we, uh, how we interact with folks in the, within the medical system. And so we definitely do a lot of work within the hospitals uh, and medical clinics here in Sac County. 40% um, of abused women are harassed at work by their partners. Domestic violence does not stay at home. Uh, it goes wherever you go. It goes to your gym. It goes to the kid's school. It goes to your workplace. Um, harassment and stalking is, um, is huge in terms of domestic violence, whether you're currently with your partner or it's an ex-partner. And so uh, we definitely do a lot of work with work, the workplace and training HR and managers about domestic violence being a workplace violence issue. And there are protected rights for employees who are victims of domestic violence and sexual violence, protected time off for things like court and counseling and employers uh, must provide this to their employees. And so we do a lot of work training workplace human resources and management around those protected, those protected rights for employees. 
if someone comes forward to their supervisor and says that they're a victim of domestic violence or sexual violence and needs time off to go to court or needs time off for a counseling appointment. Uh, so there, is a, there are protected uh, rights for, for victims of domestic and sexual violence. Three women and one man are murdered daily by their partner. Again, we don't, we don't call this domestic violence, but that's exactly what it is. And it happens in all of our neighborhoods. Um, there's a recent story in Elk Grove. Um, it's in West Sac, it's, it's, it's all over. This happens in all of our neighborhoods. We see the stories in the Sacramento Bee and we often don't call it domestic violence, but when someone is murdered by their partner or ex-partner, or the kids are murdered by their by their the, the, the parent or co-parent, that is domestic violence. And we often don't name it for what it is, which is a real disservice in terms of learning about domestic violence and how uh, dangerous it can be, um, especially when someone tries to leave an abusive relationship. That's when, when it's actually most dangerous. Sometimes that's when those threats become real. If you leave me, I'll kill you, I'll kill the kids. Um, and, and sometimes that happens. And that is what we see in our communities. And we hear about it in those stories, but unfortunately on the news and in the SACB, we don't, we don't call it domestic violence. But when you're reading that paper or watching that news and you're hearing about this happening, that's what exactly what it is. It's about, it's about domestic violence. So in terms of domestic violence, just so we all are starting here on the same um, kind of same, using the same language, um, it's a pattern of behavior used by one partner to gain or maintain power and control over the other partner in an intimate relationship. So abuse is about power and control. It's not about me being jealous or me using substances. Um, it is about, those are all factors, but it's not, um, it's not what abuse is about. Abuse is about me wanting to control my partner or my partner wanting to control me. Um, you might hear terms domestic violence, intimate partner violence, dating violence. When you're looking at programs like WEAVE, um, it is between intimate partners, current partners, ex-partners, or co-parents. So it's not necessarily the, the father who is abusing the child. Um, in, some, uh, in some definitions, that would include domestic violence. But for a program like WEAVE, we're talking about um, when it's a relationship between either a current partner, an ex-partner, or a co-parent. And again, all relationships, all genders, um, it happens to make domestic violence, intimate partner violence happens um, across, across the board in all relationships, and we provide services uh, to everybody. So this is, I'm going to share here about domestic violence, what it is. So again, we can have this common language between all of us around what makes up, what, what, what is domestic violence. This is called the power and control wheel. It's been around for over 30 years. It was created um, by the Duluth Intervention Project over 30 years ago. And I tell you, we use this every day at Weave. I highly recommend it when you're working with clients. Um, you can find this online. You can just Google power and control wheel. Now there are versions that are gender neutral uh, like this one. Um, so there are gender neutral versions uh, so that they're inclusive. They have power and control wheels in multiple languages. So you can, you can just type in power and control, gender neutral power and control wheel in Spanish and it will pop up. Um, again, this is not something where we use as a tool at Weave to tell someone they're in an abusive relationship. That is not what this is about. This is more about um, education and going through this and really talking with someone around, does this fit for you, right? And if it doesn't, it doesn't. And if it does, then we can talk about what abuse looks like. So these are all different forms of abuse, different tactics that an abusive partner could use to maintain power and control over their partner. And just like what Roger and Terry were sharing um, in trafficking, with trafficking, it could be um, a, the trafficker could be their partner. And so some of these, these tactics to maintain power and control over their partner definitely come into play. So using intimidation to control your partner, using emotional abuse, Isolation, controlling your contact and where you go, blaming you for the abuse or minimizing the abuse, uh, using kids, um, societal privilege, uh, economic abuse. We will definitely talk more about economic abuse um, and using coercion and threats. You know, if you 
if you leave me, I'll kill myself, I'll hurt myself, those types of things, using coercion and threats to keep people in the relationship. And we will go more into these, but again, these are, this is just the power and control wheel, different tactics of abuse that a partner might use to maintain that power and control in the relationship. And so how we would use this tool at Weave is we would just pull it out, right, and say, does any of this fit for you? And what happens is, you know, I've, I've been working with survivors for over 20 years now. And if I were to hand them a highlighter or a pen and have them highlight or circle these, you know, for many of them, this is just a very validating tool. Because when you're in an abusive relationship, you feel alone, you feel completely isolated. You know, you don't know that this is happening to other people. You feel crazy. And so when you see this um, tool in black and white and you can like circle things and underline things, it's like for the first time, sometimes folks are feeling like this is, I've never seen this before and I can't believe I'm not the only one. I'm not going crazy. So it's a very validating tool to use with folks. So I'm going to go over real quick real quickly, these six different types of abuse. Um, there are six types of abuse and physical, emotional, sexual, financial, spiritual, and technological. And we're going to go over them a little bit each. Um, oftentimes what happens is when we think of domestic violence or intimate partner violence, we often are, uh, oh, we, you know, our mind goes directly to physical abuse. And that's often what the media portray as domestic violence is physical abuse. But I want to share with you that physical abuse is not always present in every abusive relationship. And so it's really important to understand all six types of abuse and know that sometimes physical abuse is present and sometimes it's not. Um, but that other forms of abuse hurt just as much as physical abuse. That's often what survivors share, especially with emotional abuse. They often say the emotional abuse hurts just as much, if not more, than physical abuse. Um, because they don't have proof, they can't show anybody. Um, and so really important to understand that when we're talking about an abusive relationship, there are six different types. And sometimes physical abuse is present, sometimes not. So in terms of physical abuse, we're talking about things like throwing things, destroying your property, holding someone down, putting you in a dangerous situation. Oftentimes survivors will talk about they're driving in the car and their abusive partner takes the wheel and it's very scary because um, it puts them in a dangerous situation or the other way around, they're driving and the abusive partner um, is driving really recklessly. Um, so putting you in a dangerous situation. Uh, withholding medication and food, we unfortunately, you know, sometimes um, our partners are also our caregivers um, and we hear from survivors uh, where their partner will withhold medication or food from them, um, imprisoning or blocking you from leaving, shoving and pushing, grabbing, slapping, shaking. Um, also things like pinching, uh, pulling your hair, um, threatening you with a weapon, um, and strangulation. I really just want to stop here for a minute and talk about strangulation. This is really important, very high risk. Oftentimes survivors will not call it strangulation. They will call it choking. They'll say their partner choked them out or they lost consciousness for a minute. Really important to understand that's not choking, it's strangulation. And folks really need to know um, that medical attention is really important because that means oxygen didn't get to their brain for that moment or for however long. And they really need to seek medical attention. We at Weave can do safety planning with clients. We can do that 24-7. At the end of this presentation, I'm going to give you our website and our phone number, our 24 seven support line and all of our services. And, and we can do safety planning on the phone with a client. We do it in person every day. Um, but if someone shares with you that their partner choked them out or strangled them, very high risk. Um, we often find out as we review homicides in Sacramento County where domestic violence is present, that strangulation was present prior to the murder, prior to the uh, homicide. And so if, if it gets to the point of strangulation in, in a relationship, it's, it's very high risk. And we wanna do some, some safety planning with that, with that person as soon as possible. Emotional abuse um, is one of those things that is so difficult for folks to talk about, but it has a huge impact. They feel like they're going crazy. It's those put downs, calling you, what's when your partner calls you names puts you down, threatens to hurt you or themselves if they leave, 
or just threats in general. I'll take the kids, you'll never see them again. Um, I will, you know, if you leave me, I'll kill myself. You know, we work with teens at Weave and we hear many teens share with us that their, you know, that their partners at 13, 14, 15, 16 are sharing with them that, that you know, if they leave, their partner is saying that they're going to, going to kill themselves. And there is nothing that is going to keep you more in that relationship is when, when your partner is sharing that they're going to hurt themselves if you leave, you feel trapped, you don't want them to hurt themselves, you care about them. And especially for teens, oftentimes, sometimes the parent, the parents, the caregivers may not even know or approve of that relationship they're in. And so they feel like they have no one to go to. So really, uh, the threats to hurt you or hurt themselves or just threats in general, uh, blaming you for the abuse. You know, if you hadn't have talked to that person that way, I wouldn't have gotten so jealous, those types of things. So blaming you for the abuse, isolating you from friends and family and activities. This does not happen overnight, folks. It happens over a period of time. And it's, um, it, it's like slowly but surely over time, the partner starts to isolate you from your friends and family and activities. So maybe it's, hey, I don't want you to go out with your friends anymore. They're not good enough for you. So you and then you stop going out with your friends. Or you don't need to take that college class anymore. I'll take care of you. I got this. And so you stop taking your college classes. Um, or maybe you're going to church and your partner says, I don't like that church. They're brainwashing you. Um, so it, you stop going. And so it's little by, you know, a little bit by little over time, what happens is you start to lo lose your support system. Um, and so maybe you had the support system when you started going out with this person, but slowly over time, you start to lose supports. And so then when you really need someone, Oftentimes, um, you're very isolated and there aren't many folks there anymore. Um, so isolation is huge, huge. Crazy making and gaslighting. Survivors talk about this a lot in terms of just their partner um, doing things to kind of make them feel crazy and gaslighting them. Um, humiliation in public or private. Um, threats again and stalking. Stalking is a big deal. It's very scary. And technology is used quite a bit now with stalking. Um, and so it just, it, it has a huge impact on survivors. But again, with emotional abuse, it's one of those things where you feel like um, you start to believe those names that your partner is calling you. And it really changes how you feel about yourself. Um, and uh, like I said, many survivors have shared, you know, that they feel like the emotional abuse hurts more than physical because they can't prove it. They can't show someone what happened. It's just all in their head and it's how they feel about themselves. Um, it's just very hard to have someone who says they love you or care about you also call you names and emotionally abuse you. Sexual abuse um, is of course rape, but any form of sexual assault, any unwanted sexual activity, coercing you or pressuring you to do something you don't want to do, uh, forced pregnancies, forced abortions, uh, contraceptive manipulation, uh, unwanted pornography, threatening to cheat on you if you don't do what they want you to do, demanding or sending sexual pictures. Um, and oftentimes what we see too with teens and adults, maybe you send pictures back in the beginning of the relationship consensually. And, and then now you're saying, I want out of the relationship or I want to break up. And then that person is now saying, if you break up with me, I'm going to post those pictures on social media. I'm going to post those pictures on Facebook. I'm going to send those pictures to your boss. Um, and so it becomes then um, a way to control you so that you don't leave. Um, uh, but again, it's any unwanted sexual activity. And I would say this is one of those things that is probably the most difficult for survivors to talk about. There's a lot of shame around sexual abuse, a lot of confusion, shame, embarrassment. and um, so it's, it's just a very difficult thing for survivors to talk about. Financial abuse is definitely something we see with many of our clients here at Weave. Um, it's when your partner denies you access to money or denies you access to your financial accounts or passwords. Uh, maybe it's getting you fired from work or evicted, um, uh, giving you an allowance or stealing from you, ruining your credit. Um, for clients in our residential programs, we, we work with them on their finances and we ask them if they'd like us to do a, run a credit report so we can see where they're at. 
and start working forward with them for their future. And unfortunately, many of them find out that their abusive partner has run up their credit, has ruined their credit, has got credit cards in their name. And so not only did they leave the relationship and their home or you know, their support system to come into a safe house, now they're finding out that they're thousands of dollars in debt and they had no idea. And so we work with folks around that. Um, uh, but destroying your property, um, you know, survivors often talk about like their, their abusive partner breaking their windshield or, you know, those types of things where then you're responsible for getting that fixed after. Um, so destroying your property, excessive spending, constant texting or harassment at work. Um, Again, this is one of those things where, you know, relationships happen on a continuum where there's healthy, unhealthy, and abusive. Where it becomes abusive is if you are so anxious because your partner is texting you at work or at school, and if you don't respond back, there's going to be a consequence, an abusive consequence. That's where it becomes abusive, right? We all love our phones. We all love texting. But when your partner is constantly texting you to find out where you are, what you're doing, why aren't you responding? And you're so worried and anxious about if I don't respond, something's going to happen after. That's where it moves into the abusive part of that relationship continuum. Um, forcing or forbidding work and constant monitoring of your spending, right? We have everything online now. And so sometimes what, what will happen is survivors will talk about, you know, they'll go to the grocery store or they'll go somewhere and spend money. And then their partner is texting them about why did you spend that at that place, right? And they're just wondering, how did you even know I just went to that store? That constant monitoring of your spending. Um, the den denying you access to financial accounts and passwords is huge too, right? If you feel like you don't have access to your money or um, you know, don't have that information to get to find access to your money or, or don't have, haven't you know, been able to get access to your money, it's very hard to think about leaving. How am I going to take care of myself? How am I going to take care of my kids? Um, and so oftentimes that is one of the ways that, that a partner will control the other partner is through this financial, this financial abuse, right? Because if you don't have the finances to leave, if you don't have the means, how am I going to take care of myself and my family? Uh, spiritual abuse has to do with spirituality and it really could be deal with religion, but also just self-care and uh, taking care of yourself, you know, it's when your partner um, doesn't allow you your religious or cultural practices, or mocks your culture, mocks your religion, forces you to do something against your belief system, not allowing you to better yourself, uh, using religion to justify the abuse, not allowing hobbies, um, no time for self-care, no alone time. Um, so it has to do with just um, it could be, again, religion, it could be spirituality, and it could be just, you know, alone time or you trying to better yourself through taking college classes, and that's not, not allowed by your partner. Technological abuse is super scary, and I would say, you know, it is just completely pervasive in most abusive relationships. Um, it is when your, you know, partner uses GPS to track you which is very easy. There are apps that, that fit on your phone where the app does not visually show up on your phone and it's a tracking device. And so uh, your partner can put this app on your phone. Not you, you don't even know it's there and it tracks everywhere you go. Um, anytime you use your social media, um, there's geolocation attached to it unless you, just, unless you um, turn that off. Um, it's when your partner controls your passwords or forces you to give, give them your passwords, controlling your social media accounts, or using social media to monitor you, um, or threatening to spread rumors about you if you leave, um, or if you'd want to tell someone what's going on. You know, um, recently a survivor talked about how they wanted to leave their relationship, um, and their partner threatened to spread rumors about them on social media about um, their mental health history. Um, so just using social media to spread rumors around about you, um, cutting off or limiting your electronic communication, destroying your tech items, and of course, just stalking, using these tech items to stalk you. Um, there are things that we have that, you know, in a healthy way, they can be used in a healthy way, but if you're in an abusive relationship, they can be used to track you. Those little tiles, 
that are there that per people purchase so they can keep track of their bag or their backpack. Um, an abusive partner will throw that in the car or throw that in the purse or your backpack or something and you don't know what's even there and it tracks everywhere you go. We've had survivors find tracking devices under the wheel wells of their car. Um, and again, just your cell phone. That is, that is definitely the most, um, uh, the most uh, popular way basically for an abusive partner to monitor someone's spending, someone's activities, where you're going. Um, and that's what abuse is about. It is about power and control. It is about wanting to control my partner and everywhere they go, what are they wearing? Who are they seeing? What are they doing? Um, and so technology now, as much as we all love technology and love our cell phones, if you're in an abusive relationship, it is often used to control the partner um, and to stalk them oftentimes. Um, are there any questions about the six types of abuse before I move on? Again, I know I'm talking fast and trying to care, care, cover a lot of uh, information. Okay, I'm going to keep going here so we can cover everything. Um, I'm going to talk to you just for a brief moment about the cycle of violence. Again, I, I, you know, the reasoning for this is, is to, in order to be trauma informed, we need to understand the dynamics of an abusive relationship. And there is a common pattern to an abusive relationship. This again, just like that power and control wheel has been around over 30 years. This was, um, Lenore Walker developed this um, after working with many couples who were in an abusive relationship um, and saw this common pattern. And again, we see this every day at Weave and we talk to clients about this, um, we name it. Um, so it's called the cycle of violence. Um, so in a relationship, right, it starts out in that honeymoon phase uh, where everything is okay and you're, you know, everything is okay and you're falling in love. Um, but if you're in an abusive relationship or about to become in an abusive relationship, oftentimes in that honeymoon phase, uh, people look back and they think about really intense romantic, overly romantic gestures um, and very quick movement in the relationship. Um, but that's that honeymoon phase. And then it moves into a tension building phase. Often survivors call this walking on eggshells. It's when they're not sure what's going to set their partner off. Um, but there's a lot of tension going on. Then in that bottom line, bottom arrow, there's a trigger. That trigger can literally be everything. I feel like I've heard, you know, just everything from survivors in terms of examples for that trigger. You know, I didn't do the dishes on time. I looked at that person the wrong way. Um, I was 20 minutes late, you know, coming home from work. Um, that trigger can literally be anything. And then there's the explosion, and the explosion is when the abuse occurs, and that can be physical abuse, but again, may, maybe not. It could be emotional abuse. It could be sexual abuse. Um, so uh, that's when those, uh, that ex ex the explosion occurs. That's when the abuse occurs. And then it moves into what's called a false honeymoon or calm phase, and that's when uh, the abusive partner usually apologizes says, I'm sorry, it's never gonna happen again. I'll go to counseling, I'll stop drinking, whatever it is. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, as the person in the relationship, uh, we wanna believe them and we wanna hope that this doesn't happen again. And we wanna hope that our partner can change. And so, and so we stay and I'll talk a little bit more about why we stay. Um, and then it, what happens is then it moves back into tension building. I'll, then the tension starts to build again. I'm walking on eggshells. Um, a trigger happens, explosion, back to a false honeymoon or calm phase. And in our work with kids, we work with kids of all ages here at Weave in counseling and our residential programs. And they even can name these stages. Um, they don't, of course, know what it's called, the cycle of violence, but they even can talk about, like in counseling, when we talk about this with kids, they will talk about how, you know, when it gets really like uncomfortable in the house. And so what they do is they stay in their room and they close the door and they play video games. And then they talk about, you know, an incident happening and one parent getting really upset and yelling. They talk about what happened. And then they even talk about the honeymoon phase where they do fun stuff as a family or you know, money gets spent on, on them, you know, they go out and buy gifts or um, everything seems okay for a while. And then all of a sudden, you know, 
it's it's tense again. And so even even the children in growing up in a home with domestic violence, they they kind of can see this cycle happening too. And so it's just really important as a helper, right? Whether it's this is your friend, your coworker, or a client you're working with, it's really important to understand these dynamics so that um, we're not we're not victim blaming, right? So that we're understanding what's going on. So that if maybe a friend comes to us or a client comes to us after the explosion, we understand that maybe the next time we see them, they might be back in that false honeymoon phase, right? And so it's really hard as that helping person because it's like, oh my gosh, you're in pain. I want you to get help. I want things to get better for you. And then the next time you see them, they might be in a place where they're like, no, it's okay. We made up. Things are good. And so it's very confusing for folks outside of the abusive relationship. But it's really important as we help people to understand these dynamics, because this is a very common pattern for folks who are living in an abusive relationship. Okay, that is the cycle of violence. So now I'm going to go into uh, barriers to leaving. Um, if we're, you know, just really honest with ourselves, if we've never experienced an abusive relationship, we oftentimes will think about, well, why do people stay? Um, why don't you leave? And it's, it's really important for us to um, not immediately go to blaming the victim or not just understanding how difficult it is to leave an abusive relationship, let alone any relationship. I challenge all of you to think about where you woke up this morning and to leave and never go back, right? It is not easy. So there are many reasons why folks decide to stay um, and, you know, fear, right? Um, maybe it's those threats. Uh, forgiving their partner, hope that their partner will change, that things will get better, that isolation, uh, economic necessity. Again, if I don't have the means to take care of myself or my family, how am I going to leave? Um, those are the intimidation and threats, right? If you leave me, um, you'll never see the kids again. You know, we um, not too long ago had a survivor come in and talk to us about an undocumented survivor who talked to us about how uh, her partner told them that. Um, if, if they left, um, they were going to call ICE. And so, um, you know, it's, it's just very scary. Um, so those intimidation and threats to keep you in the relationship. Um, children, of course, trying to keep the family together. So wanting to stay for the kids. Um, lack of resources or information. Roger talked about this. Sometimes, you know, we just don't know what's out there. We don't know what the resources are. Um, we don't know what's available to us. Um, shame and embarrassment. There is a tremendous amount of shame surrounding domestic violence and sexual violence. Um, and so it takes a tremendous amount of courage to come forward and disclose. Um, and so uh, I hope we all remember that when someone discloses to us, but it, it, there's a tremendous amount of shame and embarrassment that surrounds it. And um, just so courageous when folks come forward and receive, ask for support. Um, if there's a disability or caregiving needs, sometimes that is a reason why folks stay. Immigration status, failure of the criminal justice system, fear of the criminal justice system, uh, cultural considerations, um, and love. I know this is super confusing if you've never been in an abusive relationship, but an abusive relationship is not abusive 100% of the time. There are times when your partner is loving and caring and funny, and you know, you've built memories together, and you want to believe that things are going to get better. You want to believe that things are going to change. And so there's love there too. Um, so there are a lot of reasons why folks, again, stay, choose to stay. Um, and we also, again, want to remember that the most dangerous time for someone is when they do choose to leave. Oftentimes when we say, well, why don't you just leave? It is, it's so minimizing of of everything, all the challenges that go around leaving, but it's also minimizing of the, the potential danger um, that is when it's most dangerous is when someone, because if you're talking about abuse being about power and control, if my partner is saying to me, hey, I'm leaving, that means I'm losing control. And so that's when sometimes those threats become real. Um, and so we really need to take folks seriously when they're concerned about these fears uh, around leaving. Um, it is true that folks will stay, leave, stay, leave multiple times before maybe leaving for the last time. And then I've worked with folks who have stayed, stayed forever. So, you know, um, in terms of 
being with their partner for 40, 50 years and they're not going to leave. And so then my work with that person is, okay, how can I support you? How can you stay safe in the relationship and how can I support you so that you don't feel crazy, so that you don't feel alone, right? And so that you understand what your options and resources are for support. Uh, in terms of an impact for domestic violence, um, there's a lot of, uh, of course, impacts when you are living in a relationship where there's abuse, um, anxiety, depression, blaming yourself, uh, difficulty concentrating, fear, which we talked about, isolation, we've talked about, you know, being absent from school or work, um, having problems sleeping and eating, um, of course, loss and grief, you know, loss of a sense of self, um, emotionally, lot, you know, that kind of loss of just, I don't even know who I am anymore but also just the loss of income, um, those types of things, uh, loss of a partner, uh, unhealthy coping strategies, right? We, when something happens in our life, we have coping strategies, right? And we all can relate to this. We have healthy ones, we have unhealthy ones. And um, so it, it, it's the same thing for survivors, right? And so we, we want to be non-judgmental non around this um, in terms of you know, healthy versus unhealthy coping strategies, um, you know, and think about your own, your own life and your own experiences. And when you were going through a really difficult time, you know, how sometimes you handled it, you know, with really healthy and healthy ways. And sometimes you handle it in unhealthy ways. And that's just, that's just our human way of dealing with things. And so we want to be really mindful of that. Um, and of course, folks who are at risk for homelessness, if they leave, um, an abusive relationship. And so I'm going to talk more about that in the next slide. Um, there is a huge intersection between domestic violence and homelessness. Um, national estimates show about 80% of homeless mothers with children have experienced domestic violence. 46% of homeless women reported that they had stayed in abusive relationships because they had nowhere to go. 50% uh, of U.S. cities surveyed reported domestic violence as a primary cause of homelessness. And in 2019, when we had the, um, the count uh, for homeless, homelessness, um, 195 families were estimated to be unsheltered in that one night in Sac County. So there is a huge intersection between domestic violence and homelessness. If someone is want, needing to leave or wanting to leave an abusive relationship, they oftentimes do not have a place to go. Um, and as we've all mentioned earlier in this training, housing is a huge issue. Um, safe housing, affordable housing, permanent housing, it's all an issue. Um, and people who are experiencing homelessness have high rates of past trauma, including domestic violence and sexual violence. And then if they do become unsheltered, then they're at risk for more, um, more trauma. So it's, there's absolutely an intersection between these two. Um, and I will share with you, you know, in terms about weaves services and you know our piece to that but of course uh, there's a lot of work to do here um, we have we have many folks many families who are living in their cars um, who don't have a place to go um, they need to get safe want to get safe but don't have a place to go um, so it, it is um, it is a huge issue not just for Sac County everywhere but um, but I'll talk more about kind of our little piece and what, what we can do around that. Um, in terms of trauma-informed response, I know that I'm going really fast here, but I wanna make sure we have time for questions. I just, uh, trauma-informed response has a lot of layers to it. Um, it has to do with being transparent about your role as a helper and what, what services are available to them. So a really quick example of this is, if I've got, if I've got someone calling the WEAVE support line and they need shelter for domestic violence, a trauma-informed response would not be having them go through an hour-long screening and then saying to them, we don't have space, right? That is not, right, that, that's, that's re-traumatizing. Um, sharing your story again for the hundredth time, sharing personal information for the hundredth time, being entering into a system that you're not really trusting of, um, and then telling them after all of that, sorry, we don't have space. That is not trauma-informed. So really being transparent about your role and what services are available to them, right? And letting them know what you can and can't do. Um, so if, if the shelter is full, saying our shelter is full, but I highly recommend you calling back each morning and checking in, and then we can do a screening with you, those types of things. 
being trauma informed means giving options to our clients and our family members and our friends and coworkers, not giving them answers, right? Telling someone they should leave is not helpful, not helpful, right? Just think about anything in your life when someone told you what to do, like let's say you smoke and someone said you should stop smoking and your first thought is, well, that's really helpful. <laughs> I haven't thought of that before, right? So please give people options, not answers. Don't tell them what to do, right? Here are your options. Here are your resources. We're here for you whenever you're ready. Um, being really uh being really mindful of healthy boundaries, right? We're not here to save anyone. We're not here to take anyone home with us. We're here to support folks where they're at and provide them resources, information, and do what we can for them within the scope of our role, right? Um, understand that that person in front of us is a whole person, right? When someone walks into weave, you know, that I'm not looking at that person just as they're just, they're, they're a survivor of domestic violence. No, there's so much more than that, right? We are all human beings with lots of experiences and we are whole selves. And it's really important to understand that, that we come to wherever this moment in time with lots of life experience and uh, lots of different, you know, uh, ways in terms of how we identify, as our, identify ourselves. And that leads into intersectionality, really understanding how important uh, intersectionality is. Um, so, you know, looking at, you know, again, I'm not looking at someone as, you know, solely a domestic violence or sexual assault or sex trafficking survivor that, that, you know, there, there's intersectionality going on there that, you know, um, their, their race, their ethnicity, their, their gender, their sexual orientation, uh, their religion, um, are they a cancer survivor, um, their uh, disabilities, uh, so really making sure that we're understanding that everyone comes to us as a whole person and that they have lots of roles within them, right? Um, and lots of experience, life experience that they come with them. And, and in that life experience is understanding that they walk in that door, you know, having experienced oppression and multiple isms. If someone is coming to us with domestic and sexual violence experience, I'm sure that they are also have experienced or are experiencing racism, sexism, homophobia. Um, so really being aware that, uh, that again, we're looking at this, this as a, 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 the whole person and in, 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 in their entirety and, and their whole life experience. And also looking at that survivor as, as being the expert on their life. Again, I am not the expert on their life. Um, it doesn't matter how long I have worked in this field. I am not the expert on their life. They are. And so I am there to walk with them on this path, to provide them with support, and uh, resources and options, um, and and what an honor it is to do that, right? Um, and and to help empower them again with those choices, with that information, and to support them, in whatever those choices may be for themselves. Um, so that is trauma informed response. In terms of you know how the the kind of common sense of what does that look like? How what do I say to someone? These are just some very common sense kind of examples. You know, how can I support you? I'm here for you. I'm concerned for your safety. Can we do some safety planning? You know, I'm just, I'm so glad you told me. Um, can I share some resources with you? And the most important things really, especially, you know, working with survivors of domestic and sexual violence, it's not your fault. You know, I believe you and you're not alone. So many folks feel like they are alone in this and that they're going crazy. And um, they've had experiences where they disclose to people, family members, law enforcement, and they are not believed. Um, and so it is really important that when someone discloses to us that we believe them, that we meet them where they're at, and that we let them know that they're, we're here for them and that they're not alone. Okay, in terms of WE services, um, we provide, uh, we have a 24-7 information and support line. I know there was talk earlier about 24-7 services. We do have a 24-7 support line. That's our website, weaving.org. Um, we do have a chat feature on our website. So if folks aren't comfortable using the phone, they can use the chat feature. Um, we have multilingual services. Again, all relationships, all genders. So um, really important to remember that um, even in our residential programs, we have we have male identified survivors, we have trans identified survivors, we have female identified survivors. So we have survivors of all genders, 
sexual orientations, uh, ages, um, in all of our programs. Um, we do not have any barriers in terms of um, it, we, a mom coming in with a 13 year old son. That, that's not a barrier for us. Um, we also allow pets, which is really important. That's another reason why sometimes folks do not wanna leave an abusive relationship is they're afraid what will happen to their pet if they can't take their pet where they're going. Oftentimes an abusive partner will threaten or actually abuse their pet. Um, and so that's another reason why folks choose not to leave. Um, so we can provide, um, we do have folks staying in our, in our residential programs with, with a dog or you know, whatever. So really important piece of that too. Um, I want to just share really quickly about our services. Again, we have that 24 seven support line and chat. We have free counseling services, individual and group. We have uh, a large counseling team and uh, many are bilingual Spanish speaking. Um, we also have one counselor who is um, bilingual uh, English uh, mom and um, they are provide services at Midtown, but also in the community at different sites. So we are in the community providing uh, counseling services uh, at family resource centers and such, um, as well as in Midtown. So folks do not have to come to one location. We can go to them. Um, and again, it's free individual and group counseling for survivors of sexual assault, domestic violence, and sex trafficking in all ages. Um, in our safe shelter and housing programs, because we're talking about housing here, we have an emergency safe house, which is quite beautiful in a confidential location. It can, we can have up to 80, we have 86 beds in that shelter. I know it sounds like a lot and it sounds like it would be this enormous warehouse. It's not, it's a home, it's beautiful. Um, we also have 30 transitional housing beds. Um, those are in cottages and apartments. Um, again, confidential locations. Um, we also have now uh, nine permanent supportive housing cottages that we is a very recent thing that we are working on right now, which is very exciting to have permanent supportive housing. Um, our emergency safe house, I want all folks to know what that means is up to six months. Um, so a family or a single can be with us for up to six months in our emergency safe housing. And then they can move into our transitional housing program, which is up to two years. So we have clients who are with us for up to two and a half years in our, in our housing programs potentially, and then could potentially now move into our permanent supportive housing. And all of that is free. And during that time in our residential programs, they can receive free counseling, free case management, and free legal services. We do have a legal program. Uh, so we have attorneys, we have legal um, advocates who can do accompaniment, um, uh, marriage dissolution, child custody, and again, all of that is free. We have case managers who provide just full-on case management uh, for um, all of our clients who are needing that. We have a CSEC program, so we are providing services for um, uh, children who have been exploited. Um, so we definitely have, we have CSEC advocates um, who are available to provide support to youth transitional age youth and adults. Um, so we have adult, um, we have advocates who work with adult survivors of trafficking, and we also have advocates who work with CSEC youth. Um, and then we have a prevention education program. We go and speak to anyone who listen to us. We are in the schools K through 12. We teach consent to kindergartners, believe it or not, but that's where it's got to start. We use, we use things like a dog. Um, to teach, you know, before you touch a dog, you ask for permission and you watch and listen to their response. So we are teaching consent. We are teaching healthy versus unhealthy relationships uh, to K through 12 graders, to the colleges, to the university. We have an advocate at Sac State, Los Rios Community Colleges. Um, and uh, we also go into the faith community, so churches and synagogues, and uh, we go um, social service agencies and train um, employees, but also train human resources and managers around how to support their employees who are experiencing domestic and sexual violence. Um, okay, so again, hopefully we um, covered everything. I, I, I know that was a lot of information. This is my email. Please feel free to reach out to me um, anytime. I am checking my email all the time, more than I should probably, um, and it is the best way to reach me. If you don't feel comfortable asking a question in this larger group, that's very understandable. 
uh, please feel free to email me and I will be happy to reach out. Um, so please feel free to ask questions in this forum, but if you're not comfortable, um, I would love to hear from you. And again, thank you so much for this opportunity. Jamie, thank you so much for that very informative uh, presentation. Uh, you, you elevated some very important uh, pieces here. I know I really appreciated seeing the, um, the figures you've shared. Uh, I, I know many, many folks on the call are probably familiar, have some level of familiarity with the concepts in those figures. Just good to um, see them, see them again and uh, hear you connect all of those pieces together. And you, you made a note around our technology and it's always good to, uh, it's good to bring it up, especially in this time and space, um, because as our technologies continue advancing, there it, it poses that higher risk for our, uh, for those, um, for people who are experiencing, um, who are in these circumstances or experiencing domestic violence and human trafficking and, um, trying to escape from these uh, from these situations and environments. Um, before we open it up to the larger group, I know you all have, have those questions and I already see those hands raised. Thank you, thank you. Um, I would like to pause here for a quick poll. Uh, for those of you who joined, a, who joined at the start, um, we did a pretest of um, just to assess where everyone is at coming into this training. And um, now that we've heard all of these various content today, um, would like to put up this post test just to see how we've improved from the, from the top of the call. And so you should see that poll come through. We'll spend a minute or so letting you respond to these four questions. And then for those kind of, for those who have already responded, oh. Um, and for those who are, who do have questions and want to put them in chat, please feel free to do so. Again, we're watching those raised hands. And then as we're, as we're kind of waiting for these responses to roll through, I'd love to, I'd love to give Caitlin a chance to, um, share a little bit about herself and, um, if there's anything, uh, that you would like to add regarding, uh, the intersectionality of human trafficking, domestic violence, and homelessness, and anything you'd like to share about the employment uh, in the um, E plus E program uh, that you're leading. Yeah, thanks, Nika. Hi, everyone. I think the presenters before me did a fantastic job of covering um, the depth and the different layers that both human trafficking and domestic violence come with. Um, and everyone really touched on this, but just to recap about how dynamic the people we serve their lives are and how they're just, while they also may be a victim of human trafficking or domestic violence, and they may be experiencing homelessness, there are also a lot of other barriers that come into play. Um, Terry and Christy mentioned that someone leaving a life of exploitation is not typically a straight path. Um, there are a lot of things that can get in the way of successfully leaving, but also finding housing and finding supportive resources. Some of those things might be experiencing substance use um, and addiction. Some housing programs require sobriety. And if you're experiencing substance use or addiction, that those options are off the table for you. It can also, your, it, a person's substance use and addiction can get in the way of being able to access and sustain housing. Um, in addition to that lack of income or the financial abuse mentioned by Jamie, if someone's credit is ruined by their abuser or a trafficker, it really will get in the way of them being able to successfully secure their own apartment um, and not having income. A lot of people, a lot of the individuals we work with um, sometimes are going through unemployment or have not had a job before, hadn't ha haven't had to work before. Um, and the lack of employment can really get in the way of, you know, making sure that you have enough money to be able to pay rent and everything 
every single month. Um, that's actually something that our program does at Three Strands, the Employee Plus Empower program, is we work with survivors of human trafficking, domestic violence, and other vulnerable populations to try to break down barriers to employment or education. So we do um, individualized case management services to address whatever needs are arising, including transportation, figuring out childcare, making sure they have interview clothing or access to work, a uniform and clothing, um, making sure they have access to the, the trainings or the technology that they need to reach their career goals. And then we also provide workforce development uh, readiness services. So we will help with building a resume, a cover letter, practicing interview skills, teaching uh, the people that we work with how to search for jobs, where to apply, how to make sure that a job is a safe and sustainable job. And we'll help them get connected with employment opportunities as well as training opportunities. We have someone that we just work with who um, they they were successfully able to complete a phlebotomy program and now we're helping them get connected to a job in phlebotomy we were able to actually cover the cost of that entire phlebotomy program so they didn't have to worry about the financial expenses of that and um, we do that a lot and when getting con people connected to the trainings uh, or the education is trying to make sure that we access every resource possible so that they don't have to spend money on that and that finances aren't a barrier to them successfully pursuing their career goals. Um, so that's a little bit about what we do. Um, but in addition to the other, the barriers I was talking about earlier is also involvement in the criminal justice system can also uh, be a big barrier to the individuals we work with accessing some uh, at some housing opportunities. Um, if they have something on their a criminal record on their past, some housing opportunities won't allow them to live there. Um, and then the last piece is really looking at uh, trauma. Uh, so many of anyone going through human trafficking or domestic violence has experienced a great deal of trauma. Um, and I think every presenter and Jamie did a great job of really talking about what trauma informed care means and what that can look like. But trauma will can impact the people that we serve, their ability to make decisions. Um, it impacts their mental health. Um, it impacts their engagement with services. And if they approach a service provider and feel like there is judgment there, or if they're at, if a service provider is asking questions in a way that isn't trauma informed, a lot of clients will shut down and won't access those services anymore. Um, and that is just a huge barrier to them continuing to not only stabilize, but find housing if, if they don't feel like they can trust a service provider or if a service provider has triggered them in some way. Um, it might take a while for them to try to re-access services. And so really, really, really encourage everyone to look more into what trauma-informed care means and the impacts that trauma can have on a person's being, uh, because just approaching any anyone we serve, whether they're a victim or survivor or not, in a trauma-informed manner will only help give them access to services. Um, so that's my little sum up of that. Thank you, Caitlin. And just to pick your brain further here, uh, I'd love to hear from your end, uh, what, what can our community improve so that we have uh, a more unified and collaborative response to these community issues? Yeah, I think the first thing is what everyone's doing right now is engaging in trainings and education and conversations about what human trafficking and domestic violence looks like, how it's, how it's impacting people, um, learning about the signs of it, and really gaining more awareness about how to recognize it in individuals. Um, Roger, I think, mentioned earlier in the training about, like, someone's not going to most likely come forward and just be like, yep, this is me, and this is, I've experienced A, B, C, and I, like, identify as a survivor. A lot of times, it's through our services and education process that they discover that they are a victim of these things, and so, um, uh, being more informed and knowledgeable about the signs and, and being able to help identify that in someone that you're serving. Now you have, you know, luckily we have amazing agencies on here who were able to provide a number of resources and hopefully this will help point you in the right direction. So the first piece is just continuing the conversation, continuing to engage in the, the trainings and continuing to talk with one another about what this looks like for them in their specific neighborhoods and in our community as a whole. Uh, the second thing is collaboration. Um, 
a lot of people we serve, sometimes they're in survival mode and they are accessing a number of agencies because they're just trying to make sure that their needs are met. And um, if we just take a moment to stop and assess who else is on their care team, where else have you been accessing services? What services have those places been providing? And maybe getting a contact for those services and then reaching, then after reaching out to the services, we can come together and make sure that we're A, not duplicating services, but also that we're using each other's expertise and the resources that we have to make sure that we're really supporting that whole person. Um, I would say uh, that has been what has been we, how we've seen success in a lot of the people that we've served. We at Three Strands work a ton with cash and IRC and Weave and being able to pick each other's brains and come up with creative solutions together. Sometimes someone's gonna have a resource or knowledge about a service that you as an individual or your agency didn't prior know, uh, didn't know about prior. And so being able to come together, come up with creative solutions, lean on each other's expertise and make sure that you're addressing the person as a whole, as a like as a community, as agencies, as a collaborative unit is only gonna better serve the individuals that we're serving. So hopefully that helps. Thank you so much for that, Kaylee. I really appreciate you um, digging into that. Uh, as a public health um, person, that whole person um, comment you just made truly connects with me. And so uh, now I would like to open it up to the larger group. Um, we have our wonderful presenters here. Uh, all of them are still with us. And so if you have any particular questions, uh, we are monitoring chat. I do, um, I know I have seen some raised hands. And so let's see here, um, who do we have at the top? Um, let's see. I see Zuri, would you like to ask your question for any specific individuals or uh, the larger set of pre uh, our presenters? Yes, thank you, Mika. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much for having this forum. It's very, very informative and I appreciate uh, being able to get more tools um, as we do direct services and uh, support our unhoused community members and those who are marginalized with resources. Um, I had a couple of questions specifically uh, for Weave. Um, I know that um, there was a location out here in the South area that Weave had a, uh, it's kind of like a, a, a satellite office. Um, have you guys thought about reopening that due to the, um, our South area community and our marginalized areas are very under-resourced when it comes to getting supports and uh, with uh, whether it's domestic violence, escaping violence, sexual assault. Uh, we're seeing more and more numbers of our unhoused ladies on the streets actually returning to these encampments, returning to these encampments where they've been hurt. Um, and I was just wondering if that satellite office would be uh, open. Then I did have a question uh, for Jamie and I know, um, I know that you guys do a lot, but um, I was wondering about, uh, there have been times we have referred uh, women who've been on the streets uh, to the program. They receive no follow-up. I also, at one point with CLAP, uh, tried to add that to a resource list, but we like to vet our resources first um, and ask for just some follow-up with, like I said, people returning to encampments, just looking for other choices with the increase of our unhoused ladies out here on the streets vulnerable. And I've received no follow-up. So I was just wondering, is there a process to actually speak to someone, whether you're an unhoused community member and you need to escape a violent situation or is there like a community coordinator that you can uh, follow up with there? So we're actually getting to the right avenue for tools and resources for our community we can provide. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so let's see. Your first question: We did used to have a a, a satellite counseling center in South Sac, um, but yes, that is closed. Um, so instead, what we have is we have embedded advocates and counselors throughout the community. So we have um, at the Birth and Beyond Family Resource Centers um, all over Sacramento County, including South Sac. 
uh, we have um, an advocate and a counselor embedded there to provide services there in the community at the Family Resource Center at the Birth and Beyond. Um, and so we are currently at eight of those centers. Um, and so that's how, if, if coming to the business office is not an option, um, we have embedded the, the embedded advocates and counselors at these eight locations um, at the Family Resource Centers of Birth and Beyonds. Um, and then we have other embedded locations too, um, like in police departments and at the colleges. Um, so all Los Rios Community Colleges. Um, so that is how, um, you know, in terms of access in the community. Um, in terms of the second, the second piece, I, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry to hear about that, but I absolutely know that that happens. So I think the best thing would be, would it be great if you emailed me <laughs> and, um, and I can connect you to the right people. Um, I know that, um, you know, just like all of, all of us, I know that we all do great work. And I also know that sometimes, um, sometimes there are gaps in services or things fall through the cracks and they shouldn't. So I really appreciate you sharing that. And, and I would like to follow up with you on it and absolutely, um, someone should be following up with someone if they're reaching out to we. Um, I mean, I, I do want to, you know, our, the emergency safe house is, um, it's, it's, I know it sounds crazy. It is a large safe house with a lot of beds, but it is often full too. Um, and it is for folks who are uh, currently leaving, escaping a domestic violence situation. Um, so that, that is a gap in services for sure. Like if, if domestic violence was present a year ago, and then now that person or that family is homeless due to domestic violence, and then they're, they're, they're seeking shelter now through WEAVE, um, that is not gonna be, you know, is, that's not gonna be as, e as easily accessible um, as opposed to someone who is currently trying to escape a domestic violence situation today. Um, so there are some gaps in services, absolutely. But, but please follow up with me. My email is on the screen. I, I hope to hear from you. Okay, I just had one additional question. I know there's a lot of advocates who are gonna have amazing questions, but you guys spoke about uh, stalking. Uh, and I know that that was not a highlight of your uh, organization at one point, but there's, it's been prevalent amongst this training uh, uh, technology for the use of stalking. Uh, and I know years ago, maybe it wasn't as prevalent and people weren't as aware. Uh, what is Weave or anybody on the panel doing um, to provide those tools to our community members and maybe even our advocates on the level, the intense level that you talked about, Jamie, this has been happening for years. But when folks have reported that, uh, they've translated their stories, uh, they're, they're not believed, or even by uh, domestic violence organizations where that's happening. Um, I think that's extremely important for our folks who may have phones and that may be all they have on the streets. Is, is that something anybody on the panel can touch on after the advocates? I don't know if they have questions first, but I think it's important because you guys mentioned a lot of things that we see happening to folks who are on the streets and even those who are sheltered. Yeah, I mean, I, I just have technological abuse is rampant and, you know, and unfortunately it moves faster than the criminal justice system. And so even law enforcement don't, they, there isn't much necessarily they can do unless there are other forms of abuse tied to it. And we inform, we inform folks to document, document, document. So do not delete the texts, do not delete the pics. Um, do everything they can to document everything. Um, that is really important. Um, doing things like turning off the location on your phone. Um, so we, we do a lot of training with our staff around technological abuse. There's a great organization called NTAB. Um, I highly recommend it. Great resource for technological abuse training and information. So we train our staff around it. And um, it is definitely something that I, would, I mean, really, that most or all survivors are experiencing. Um, and, you know, from the stalking to even things like, I think it's called deep fakes and, you know, just a whole bunch of things that are happening now through technology that are really scary, but very hard to prosecute on its own. So, and I would like to jump in. Um, this is Terry. My video back. Sorry. Um, 
So Christy mentioned that she has a, a program that is for women who have been a victim of crime. And that's not a reported crime. That's, a, that's just a criminal act that a, a, a person has um, been the victim of, which this is one of those crimes. And so her program, and that's the comprehensive up to two year program, um, that is a crime that a woman could come and talk to us about. And that would, would qualify her for that program because we do understand that stalking is something that is very prevalent and then the online um, aspect of this is something that we definitely see. Thanks for jumping in there, Terry. Uh, I see we have a couple more hands raised. Uh, we'll start with Cher and then go to Crystal. Yes. Uh, thank you very much to all the presenters. I think uh, you did a fabulous job and I appreciate that. Um, I was writing my questions down as Jamie was talking, and, and so I'm just going to quickly go over them because I think you sort of answered, and I hope I remember it. So I was thinking, how many um, safe houses do you have? Is it the one with 80 beds that you have, or you have more than one? We have more. So we have one emergency safe house uh, in a confidential location, and then on that same safe house campus, we have cottages. The okay. cottages are for transitional housing. Okay. And the safe house is for emergency housing. And then we also have an apartment building that is a combination of emergency housing and transitional housing. Yeah. And then we recently um, are now building nine permanent supportive housing units where people can stay permanently. And so do you have uh, security cameras and all those things at all those places? We do. Yeah. And, and the funding for your, as you're building new ones, that, that is awesome. It took us five years and the, the, the domestic violence board I was on to get grants to build a second larger one in New York, uh, upstate New York. Um, so um, the transitional six months safe housing the cottages that you have, um, while they're there, that's where you're teaching you're, you're helping them to simulate within the same society or are they moving away because of their abusers or how does that work? Um, so the, the, emergency how, the emergency safe house is for up to six months and the transitional housing is up to two years. Okay. Um, and during that time, it's, it's really working with folks on uh, where do they wanna go from here, rebuilding, rebuilding their life, you know, it could be signing up for college classes, it could be finding a job, it could be uh, working on their credit because of their credit history um, and or eviction history and, and having a hard time being able to get into an apartment, you know, so it's, it's working on all of those things. It's counseling, um, parenting, whatever it is that they're needing, um, that's what we're working on, on them with. And um, but it's their goals, not our goals. So but the danger yeah. of, of the abuser, because we've experienced that where, you know, the, we try to place them or they, the abused women, wanted to, the victims wanted to go somewhere else because they're afraid of their abuser. So I was just wondering if by, by a percentage of most people, most women stay you know, within their area. That's what I was asking. Oh, if they stay in their area or leave geographically? Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's really varies. Um, okay. Many stay in the area because of that's where their support system is. Um, but we do have we do have survivors definitely leaving, either moving, you know, in California or out of state to where like family might be, um, and so connecting them to services there. Um, it, it just varies, to be honest. Yeah. And um, within the dis disability uh, air, uh, area, um, you, you work with, with agencies that will shelter people with disabilities who may be abused also, women, because we dealt with that too. Yeah, we, we provide um, residential services. Well, all of our services are for uh, all survivors. So if someone has a disability, we have survivors who are blind or low vision in our safe house. Um, so, you know, it, it, uh, we work with all survivors and try and, and when they're with us, we just, you know, work on getting the resources they need, making sure that our safe house has everything they need. If they need um, certain um, resources or materials, 
um, you know, while they're living in our residential programs, um, then we absolutely try and just, you know, work with them on, on receiving those things, whatever that is. So we, we do have survivors who have disabilities who are receiving services both in our residential programs and in our counseling programs and case management. And um, lastly, um, this is an issue that we dealt with um, from the victims themselves sometimes because we all come with our biases and how we approach things. Um, do you house like your trans people or anyone else who's in the LGBTQ uh, community all together and, and uh, the victims who are staying at those places, are they comfortable with that or not? Because that's an issue that we saw uh, had to deal with as well. Yeah, I mean, so I would say that I, I, we are lucky enough to have different options. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, that is something that we would work with the survivor with as they move into our residential program. So recently we had um, a survivor who identified as trans and they did not feel as comfortable in the larger communal um, style safe house. Mm -hmm. but, but we have an apartment building that are, is, is available. Some of the apartments are for emergency housing. And so we were able to house them in one of the apartments. Um, so we work with the survivor around their comfort level and and then it's also, you know, an opportunity um, for learning and growth, to be honest, mm -hmm. for everyone um, in, in all of the programs. So um, we, uh, you know, we strive to be inclusive and that, you know, doesn't include just us having um, folks into our programs. We also need to talk about what that, what is, you know, let's, let's, how is it going to be living together and let's talk about it um, and let's learn and let's grow. So we don't want to steer away from that. You know, we want to kind of face it and we want to talk about it with everyone. So, you know, the safe house is a home. It's a big home, but it's a home and um, we want everyone to feel welcome there. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Crystal, we'll go to you. And then um, anyone else who have questions around domestic violence or the human trafficking piece, please feel free to uh, unmute yourselves afterwards and we'd love to hear from you. Crystal, are you still there? Yeah, sorry, I'm having technical issues. <laughs> no worries. Um, so um, I have two questions for Jamie um, around, I guess, the programming. Um, I am a domestic violence survivor who almost lost my life to domestic violence. And um, my question, my first question is, is I went through domestic violence in the city of Citrus Heights um, and they had a social worker who came out with law enforcement. Um, does we have that type of a program? Because I know that the very first reaction of a police department is to come in and do the crime and that doesn't always work with the trauma. Yeah, no, thank you for your question. Yes, so we actually have embedded advocates at Citrus Heights Police Department now. So um, they are domestic violence and sexual assault advocates and they work with the Citrus Heights Police Department and they go out on calls and they also call when there's been um, an incident, they, they contact the victim the day after. And, and so they do ride alongs, they do all of that. So. Um, but we also are at other police departments too, Elk Grove Police Department, SAC PD, SAC Sheriff. Um, so we do have embedded advocates with the police departments now, which really, it really does help because yes, law enforcement are doing their thing and may not necessarily um, uh, always respond in the way we, we would like them to. Um, and so it's right. really amazing to have that. Um, have that advocate there to provide emotional support, crisis intervention, and just uh, non-judgmental care and uh, resources and options. Right, that's where I came in. That was uh oh. I think I think we lost you, Crystal. You're like frozen. Can you see me or hear me? <laughs> Oh, hear you now. now we can. <laughs> Sorry, my my internet's bad. Um, it was just it was helpful to have that person. 
can come in because law enforcement again comes in for the crime element of it and it makes it really hard. Um, my other question is, is there any programming for men? Because we know that domestic violence on uh, men is definitely prevalent and on the rise. Yeah, we absolutely, we, survive, we, we provide services to all survivors of all genders. So we provide sur services for male survivors, the sexual assault, sexual abuse, domestic violence, um, sex trafficking. So um, we absolutely are providing services to male survivors of all ages, both in our counseling, case management, and residential programs. All right, we are coming close to the end of our training today. We'll take one more question and then we'll, um, we'll be sharing some final updates for you all. I don't see any more raised hands, um, but if there's anyone in the chat, please feel free to just unmute yourself. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, um, but if something does come up after this training, please do feel free to uh, reach out to any one of our presenters or to myself or Stacy, if you have any SSF related questions, we're happy to um, connect with you and help um, get you the resources that you need. Um, I just wanted to take the time to thank you all uh, for participating in today's discussion. And um, before you head off to your next meeting or to lunch, we're excited to share that our COC board has approved our recommendation to conduct a 2022 PIT count, point in time count. Uh, so the PIT is HUD mandated every other year, making 2021 actually um, our slated count year. However, due to COVID-19 safety concerns, we were waived from conducting a, a count this year. Uh, we do recognize that the PIT produces essential data that can be used for our programming and our initiatives. And so we're looking forward to do a PIT um, early next year, even if it is not required. We're also going to be releasing more details about our PIT committee membership and also with more details around volunteer recruitment and training. And so please, uh, if you are not already on our listserv, uh, please sign up at uh, our website and um, you will receive those updates through, uh, through, those, um, through those newsletters. And then also uh, you're welcome. We welcome you to visit our website uh, for any other resources that you might be looking for. Um, and also just to flag, this training, this recording, and uh, the materials that have been um, that have been shared are going to be available on our website soon. And so, uh, if you go to this link, um, you can access this and then other uh, our previous sessions. Um, let's see here. We'd also appreciate it if you can please take our short survey, short uh, post-discussion survey. Uh, this will help us to ensure that uh, we're, we're, we continue providing um, useful and uh, needed trainings for you, uh, for, your or for your agencies, and for yourselves as you continue this work in a homelessness space. And so um, all, of your, uh, all of your feedback are going to be uh, are, are most uh, definitely um, appreciated and we'll be reviewing those and will help us continue improving. And with that, again, thank you to our wonderful guests for your uh, very informative presentations and to our participants, your contributions today have been uh, so amazing. Uh, again, if you have any further questions that uh, we weren't able to get to today, please reach out and we'll ha we're happy to coordinate. Um, yes, and with that, I wish you all a happy weekend and um, I look forward to seeing you on our next training. Thank you.